Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, want to call this meeting to order. I realize some people are just coming on, but we've got quite a few here. Um, I think we'll start by asking Judd to call the roll, please. I'd be happy to. Can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mike Alley. Yes, I'm here. Dennis Bland. Present. Ann Bowen. John Costas. Present. Trent Ingers. Present. Ed Fisher, here. Alan Hubbard. Here. Chris Lamoth. Pepper, Pepper Mulherin. Sorry, Chris here. Murphy. Here. Dan Peterson. Here. Beverly Pitts. Here. Joe Pop. Here. Uh, we have a quorum. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Judd. Madam um, Chair, I, I don't know whether everybody picked up on that, but I think I saw both Ann and Pepper. I don't know if Judd got those or not. I heard Pepper at the end there, but I did not hear Ann. So I will say that we are completely full today. Great. Chris Lamoth is joined. That makes us full. We definitely are full. Yes. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Judd, and thanks, Teresa, too. As you know, we had to change our original plans at being at Indiana University's campus in Bloomington today. We certainly missed the opportunity to see the campus and interact with the staff. Even though we can't be there on campus, we'd like to invite President McRobbie to say a few words of welcome. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Madam uh, Chairwoman. I'm assuming you can hear me okay? Yes, well, thank you. Okay, good, good. Um, I, I can um, uh, assure you uh, the campus is looking absolutely beautiful too at the, at the moment. Um, so this, if you want to don a mask, you're welcome to walk at that uh, at any time. So if I could uh, welcome uh, you, Commissioner Lovers, and uh, uh, all the members of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, I gather you have a a full house, as you put it before. All of us at Indiana University and indeed all of us in higher education across the state are, of course, deeply grateful for the dedication and the support of the members of this commission over the years. And especially during this time when colleges and universities in uh, Indiana and across the nation are facing the enormous challenges of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, of course, we really have not seen anything like it ever. And while the pandemic has precluded your holding this meeting on the Bayou Bloomington campus, as uh, you noted, was originally scheduled, it has not stopped us here at IU from continuing to meet our core mission of bringing greater health and prosperity to Hoosiers through the world-class education that we offer. A new academic year, one that promises that's already shown itself to be like no other in IU's 200-year uh, history is underway on our campuses across the state. Of course, I should note that this, in fact, is our, um, even though the last academic year was our formal bicentennial year, this is the calendar bicentennial year of the university. So we are 200 years old as of um, this year as well. In fact, we are now into week three of just completing week three of uh, the fall semester of this academic year. We have established one of the most comprehensive testing and screening programs uh, among all US colleges and universities. And this is in turn is anchored by the partnership with IU Health for testing members of the IU community who have COVID symptoms. We are also strongly committed to the best individual safety practices, including masking up and maintaining physical distancing practices that I'm sure that you all know are crucial in keeping our campus communities as safe as possible and in limiting the spread of the virus. With our students doing their part, we are cautiously optimistic that we can safely and successfully conduct the fall semester and the academic year with the blend of in-person and online instruction that we now have in place. We look forward uh, of course, to strengthening our partnership with the Commission during the challenging times in the years ahead as well. So again, um, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Commission, 
our thanks to you for your support of Indiana University and all of us at IU wish you well as you engage in your um, enormously important deliberations about the state of higher education in uh, in Indiana. So um, with that again, um, welcome and thank you. Thank you, President McRobbie. Uh, we certainly look forward to visiting the campus again in the near future. We miss it. Um, I wanted to add too that we commend you and all the institutions for all you've done in the last many months to create and maintain a safe environment and flexible learning opportunities for students in really difficult times. And we do appreciate that hard work. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Lebers for her report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks for all of you for being here with us today. I wanna begin um, my report today by thanking President McRobbie for his welcome, of course, but more importantly, to express the commission's gratitude and my personal appreciation for your service and leadership. We all followed the recent announcement that you would be uh, retiring next year. And I know that there will be many opportunities for us to highlight the impact of your presidency, but I didn't wanna miss this particular opportunity to thank you for your partnership with the commission. Uh, we look forward to this partnership uh, throughout this year as we navigate some tough challenges and new opportunities and delighted that you're still going to be there with us to help us do that together. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of new challenges, and you highlighted some of them, there are certainly many. We're feeling them here at the commission, as I'm sure all of our partner colleges and universities are as well. I'm sure that we'll hear this from you, President McRobbie, and the other presidents who present their budget requests to us today uh, and the fiscal uh, realities and challenges that you're facing. Uh, while we're, you know, we know we're facing enrollment challenges and we'll be highlighting those, especially at our October meeting where we do our official enrollment count for the members of the commission. Uh, it's clear that our challenges with college going rates have been exacerbated because of COVID-19. Uh, just a, a, a little preview of those numbers, if you've been following, is that we have seen enrollment declines on uh, all of our campuses um, with the exception of two. Uh, from double digits down to just really flat or barely, barely losing some enrollment. But regardless, we know that uh, that with the recent uh, decline in high school graduates who are going to college and these numbers, it creates certainly a new challenges for colleges and universities. Um, and our need to continue to really double down on our efforts to show the value proposition of higher education. I think it's more important than ever that we do that in very clear ways to Hoosiers. Um, we also know, we may be hearing about some of this today, that as institutions have dealt with COVID-19, it's come with a tremendous cost to them to make sure that their students and faculty and staff are safe. And it's, we're talking millions and millions of dollars to do that. Uh, the federal CARES dollars, uh, Indiana received for higher education around 239 million that went directly to Indiana colleges and universities has helped, but the costs are still escalating and continuing for the cost of keeping everyone's safe. Um, it's believed and I hope um, hopeful that additional federal funding will be allocated to the institutions. Uh, these negotiations are underway even as, as we meet here today. Uh, in some other ways in which the federal dollars have helped, recently Governor Holcomb announced that $61 million in federal funds would go to K-12 schools and higher education to improve what's become a very clear need, which is uh, related to e-learning, virtual learning, uh, to improve connectivity and increase the number of devices that students and families have around the state. Uh, 12 of our higher education institutions will receive about 11 million of that 61 million to fund specialized training and provide targeted professional development. Um, these resources were made available at no cost to Indiana K-12 teachers. So we really appreciate the ways in which Higher education has stepped up to partner with K-12 to make sure that academic rigor and quality learning is taking place at our schools. Um, I'm, I'm probably stealing his thunder because President McRobbie will certainly mention this, but a promising COVID related announcement was made just last week by Indiana University. The IU School of Medicine was selected as a site for COVID-19 vaccine clinical trial. Um, I'm sure you'll provide some more details, but we're all holding our breath to make sure that uh, life does return as much as possible to normal when we have uh, the positive results of these clinical trials and certainly an acknowledgement of the work of the IU School of Medicine in this regard. 
the last item I want to highlight, and I think Liz is going to bring it up on the screen for you right now, is the work of the Attainment Academy, which has been a multi-state, I think there are seven states that have been involved, of which Indiana has been one, multi-year effort to really increase post-secondary attainment. As you may recall, I know you do because you voted on the, uh, the new strategic plan, which leads us to 2025 with that goal of having at least 60% of Hoosiers to have a quality credential beyond high school by 2025. Mm -hmm. Uh, the recent numbers showed that we're now at 48.5% uh, in 2008 when we started calculating attainment, uh, we were at 33.4%. Part of this bump, and uh, almost 10%, has come from the inclusion of quality certificates and industry certifications. But we know that we have work to do to make sure that we can close that gap. But, you know, we talk about the gap, we talk about the number, but what we're really talking about is people having the opportunity to have a good job and really diversifying and strengthening our economy and needing employer, meeting employer needs as well. In particular, Indiana has highlighted five areas that will help us get to that number of 60%. And it stems everywhere from uh, our partners with K-12 and the transitions from high school to college to returning adults. And so one of the first ways that we will do this, and I'm just going to highlight the main words on the screen. Uh, we can talk about this in greater depth at another time, as in fact, we bring strategies around the goals that we have. First is to increase the number of post-secondary quality credentials that are awarded to high school students. We know that students who continue having had early college credit or credentials are likely to save time and money and have the opportunity for a successful transition to higher ed. We also know, and we've been working with our partners in the General Assembly to increase the number of FAFSA filings statewide. Uh, I'm concerned that during this time of COVID-19, uh, we lost an opportunity with some uh, families and students to make sure that they were completing the FAFSA so that they could be eligible for merit and need-based aid and institutional aid as well. And so we're gonna double down on our efforts to make sure that we are um, ensuring that more students complete the FAFSA so that they, they in fact get the money that they deserve. Clearly in alignment with our strategic plan, we'll be working to increase the number of post-secondary credentials that are awarded by our two and four year institutions. And the numbers from our completion report show improvement in this area as well, but we can't take our uh, eye off of the goal, which is to increase them even more. Much of our efforts in the last year uh, have been focused on returning adults. This was taking place before COVID-19, but with the double digit unemployment rates, we've been working even harder to, in, to increase the number of adults who are pursuing and earning a post-secondary credential. And really through targeted research, we're working uh, with communities and faith-based organizations as well as our colleges and universities to make sure that adults understand the opportunities that are there for them. And then finally, um, and also uh, consistent with the needs that have been realized by COVID-19, we're working to ensure equitable and quality offerings for online teaching instruction to make sure that opportunity and rigor are there for our students. These are just a few of the areas, and there are multiple other areas underway, but I know that today's agenda is full, so that completes my report for today, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Levers. Uh, normally, we would have our commission uh, committee reports right now, but we're going to postpone those to, to after the budget meeting. I think that will be uh, better for our schedule. Uh, we have one item we need to, to carry out on, that is the uh, uh, minutes, and I will uh, they are in your budget book and are in your book and I'll ask for a uh, approval. A motion. So moved. Second. Second. This is John. Mike Alley, second. Yep. Got it. All in favor say aye. 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 All there. Say, uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Now we're ready to begin the budget presentations. Today, we hear from four of our public colleges and universities. Our next meeting, as Teresa said, we will hear from the other three public universities. Those familiar with this process will recall that it's the first step in developing the budget for the next biennium. 
After the presentations from all the public institutions, the commission will provide a full higher education budget recommendation to the legislature. Commissioner Levers will present those recommendations to the state budget committee prior to the start of the legislative session in January. Today, we will hear from Indiana University, Indiana State University, the University of Southern Indiana, and Ivy Tech Community College. Each presentation will take about 30 minutes and we'll have some additional time for some questions from commission members. But in order to be fair to each institution, we will stick closely to our time allotment of 45 minutes. So be patient with me if I close down the conversation. We begin, however, with Indiana University, and I'm very pleased to recognize again, President Michael McRobbie. President McRobbie. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm gonna try and <laughs> if I can run this myself. Uh, Let's see, you should have that up on your screens now, right? We do. That's good. Well, I'm a professor of computer science, and so that means I won't take my degree away from me, I hope. <laughs> so um, well, again, thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair, and uh, other members of, of, the, uh, of the commission as well. And, uh, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, discuss our 2021-2023 biennial budget uh, request. I've done quite a few of these and this obviously will be my, my last. In this presentation, I will uh, touch today um, on, uh, on the significance of higher education in today's world. I'll, I'll explain how Indiana University is poised to propel Indiana forward and I'll preview a recent study on IU's economic impact in the state that we will be uh, releasing soon in the next few weeks, actually. From there, I will um, provide a preview of our fall 2020 enrollment, give a sort of thousand foot view of the university's um, FY 2021 operating budget, and follow this with um, IU's 2021-2023 uh, uh, the budget request. And I will end by highlighting in a few ways how the university is partnering with the state uh, throughout the pandemic and the value of these partnerships as well. Now, the world has changed enormously since March, and that is especially true for higher education. And as we survey the impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on our country and state, uh, it's already apparent that the pandemic is exacerbating societal disparities. For instance, whether we are talking about the public health impact or the economic impact, the brunt of the most negative effects are being borne disproportionately by minorities and those of lower socioeconomic status. Disheartening as it may be, this makes some intuitive sense. I suspect that most of us in attendance today are fortunate enough to work in, in jobs that we can do remotely. That's what it looked like from the from the screen before. But for many of our fellow Hoosiers, the choice, if there is a choice presented, is to stay home and forego a paycheck or show up for work and then greatly risk the chances of infection. As a growing body of research is suggesting, perhaps the greatest uh, predictor of whether or not an individual can work remotely is whether or not they have a college degree. Indeed, when we reached peak employment in April, the unemployment rate for those with at least a four-year degree was 8.5%, uh, as you can see from, from this uh, slide here, uh, for those, as I said, who have a four-year college degree. And while those without a college degree faced, if you go to the left, faced uh, a nearly 20% unemployment rate. And th those, those have declined, uh, they obviously uh, still remain um, very high, almost twice as high uh, for people with high school or less qualifications than people with, with um, four-year degrees. We've also seen the largest job losses come in the leisure and hospitality industries. The wholesale and retail um, industries and the manufacturing industries, industries where in general a college education is required less often and where jobs are nearly impossible to do remotely. Not only are many of the jobs that do not require a degree impossible to perform remotely, but prior to the pandemic, data from the Indiana Department of Workforce Development showed that 80% of the uh, most in-demand jobs over the next 
next decade will require some level of college education. One can only imagine that trend too will be exacerbated as many sectors accelerate plans to adopt the automation and AI strategies. At IU, we understand that any new or continued investment from the state demands an innovative partnership with both Indiana and its citizens. We realize the public health landscape has changed and we must ensure that we are keeping the state at the edge of medical and public health advances. The nature of work is changing and we must ensure our students are prepared for the challenges of the 21st century. And the state's economy is changing and we must ensure that we are better meeting the needs of businesses in preparing their future employees. Investment from the state is vital for our institutions, so ultimately we must prove that Indiana University remains vital to Indiana and its successes. Such a partnership between Indiana University and the state of Indiana will not only improve public health and economic outcomes, but also propel all Hoosiers forward. We know the nature of work has radically changed in a short period of time, and many of those changes are likely to stick. Working from home will become, in many instances, more routine, but this in turn will bring major challenges. In fact, many businesses are already uh, rewriting their policies to encourage more remote work. Where you live will no longer be tied to where you are employed. This presents both an opportunity and a challenge for every state, but especially those states like Indiana that are otherwise very well poised to compete for jobs in a 21st century economy. The opportunity is a chance to attract more Americans to migrate to the Hoosier state and grow our economy at the pace we'll come to expect over the next decade, over the past decade or so. The challenge is whether we, we will have the will to start this coming intrastate competition before others realize it has begun, or if we will be playing catch up to the other states in the next five to 10 years. But whether we are fa focused on the opportunity or the challenge, a crucial component will be the investment in a higher education system that produces the sort of skilled and credentialed workforce we know will be demanded. So how is IU propelling Indiana, Indiana forward? Well, the university remains a leader in degree production in Indiana with over 22,000 degrees produced in FY 2020, which is nearly half of the degrees produced by all other institutions in the state. Since 2010, IU's overall degree production has, in fact, the last 10 years, has, in fact, increased nearly 25%. IU produces, as you can see from this graph, these graphs here, IU produces nearly half of all bachelor's degree degrees, nearly half of all master's degrees, and over half uh, of all doctoral and professional degrees. We are, the, we are the largest producers of doctors, nurses, teachers, and dozens of other vital professions at a time when many of these fields are seeing labor demand increase. So not only is IU producing nearly half the, state, the state's college educated workforce, we are also ensuring that education is affordable. Over the past eight years, annual student loan borrowing has dropped by about $140.6 million or 21.6%, an enormous decrease. We've also increased undergraduate gift aid, uh, partly as a result of our, uh, our campaign, which is about to conclude, and, and a number of other factors, uh, for a total of $132 million uh, in the last um, academic year as well. We're ensuring that uh, students are prepared to enter the workforce. Over 21,000 students at the university, that's about a quarter of the university population, participate in career coaching, resume writing, interview preparation, and other training that helps prepare them to get their first jobs. All campuses, uh, this is a fairly recent development as well, but all campuses are also using um, one job posting platform now, which makes it easier for employers to post open positions and connect with students ac across the state. And we are also ensuring that IU Hoosiers see success after graduation. The career outcome uh, outcome rate, um, that is the, the, the number of uh, uh, students who accepted employment, who are pursuing a continuing degree or served in a military or volunteer program in FY19 was 93%. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, of uh, those students who accepted employment, 
83% in turn of those uh, were able to secure employment in their field of study, which is, I think, very important. So they, so most of them chose a field in which they were able to get a job. So in addition to providing more institutional gift aid and focusing on lowering the total amount of student loan debt secured by our students, IU is making progress in educating students to make fiscally responsible choices, which includes taking more credit hours per, per semester so they can complete their program in less time. The success of the increased credit hours is seen in our performance funding outcomes, of course, as I think you know, as well as in the decreases of individual student debt loads. So 84 percent, 84 percent of students who graduate from IU uh, have less than $30,000 in debt or no debt. In fact, it's 40%, 47% have no debt at all. Additionally, the average debt of IU graduates with student loans, which is a very important distinction, has decreased from uh, nearly 29,000 to, um, to 26,617, uh, 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 which, which is a drop of, of 8% since um, FY 2014. And at the regional campuses, the average student loan debt is as low as 23,929. Uh, additionally, based on the average earnings and average debt of IU uh, bachelor degree recipients with full-time jobs, monthly debt payments uh, are 6.9% of monthly income which is considerably less, nearly uh, or only about two thirds um, of the generally accepted rule of, of uh, 10%. And of course, from these figures, this number is continuing to decline. And this graph here shows you the, the, the breakdown by the different, um, the different uh, uh, debt categories. So it's, I think it's clear that um, this figure highlights the sound, the very sound investment of, of an IU degree. Now, um, Given the economic trends that the pandemic has caused, we know a changing state economy threatens to widen the achievement gaps for minorities and those of lower uh, income levels as well. And we are um, in this area very proud of our ongoing commitment to all Hoosiers. Uh, if you look at this map here, uh, Indiana residents make up 70% of all degree seeking students. Um, these about 63,000 Hoosier students are by far the largest number of Indiana residents enrolled at any college or university. Our commitment to all Hoosiers can be seen through our commitment to diversity and equity of student and students and faculty. But this is especially true of our 21st uh, century scholars uh, uh, program as well. Over a 16 year period, I use domestic enrollment of um, underrepresented minorities has increased by 110.7%. Um, th th this really is a remarkable number. Um, you know, we we have seen over the last couple of months um, a, a, a rise for reasons I don't have to uh, reiterate here in uh, racial tensions across the uh, country based on uh, a range of different racial inequities as 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 well. And one of these is access to higher education. But over this period, this 15 year period, we have seen a, a, a doubling, a more than doubling of the number of minority students at Indiana University. And our percentage of minority students now um, exceeds the state's minority population percentage. We, as an overall percentage, we have more minority students than, than the state has by a couple of percent. And of all of Indiana, Indiana's public um, higher education institutions, IU has the largest number of minority uh, uh, minority students as well. Um, as I said, we've focused on recruiting and enrolling 21st century scholars. Since FY 2015, the university has seen a significant increase of 32 percent of um, uh, of of 21st century scholar recipients here as well. And we're also proud to say that across all our campuses, on-time completion rates for scholars, which has uh, been a very important component uh, here, has improved in the last five years as well. And these increases in on-time completion range from 8.4% to 28.3%, uh, which is a, a, a really major, major increase as well. I mean, this was always a problem with 
um, in this area where um, though it was possible to uh, to attract students as scholars here, the completion rates um, were were less than was desirable. But this is an area where we've been able to really improve in recent years as well. And in addition, uh, Indiana University has has 6,000 more Pell students than the entire Ivy League, Harvard, Cornell, Princeton, UPenn, et cetera. It's, that's 56% more than the entire Ivy League. And I think this demonstrates our commitment to all students while we remain one of America's leading research universities at the same time. As I mentioned earlier, the um, a state's economy is changing, but one thing uh, remains the same, and that is, as I've already said a number of times, higher education is the pathway to both individual and state economic success. Earlier, earlier this year, um, uh, IU contracted with uh, MC, which is a labour market analytics firm, and is in fact an uh, affiliate of the Strata Education Network, to do a study on the university's statewide economic impact. That report will be released in the next few weeks, as I noted earlier, and when it is available, we will, of course, um, share the, the full report and all of its findings with um, all of you as well. But I'm happy here to preview just a few of the um, highlights of, of this study. During uh, FY uh, to, uh, 2019, um, IU created $9.9 .9 billion in added income for Indiana over this, over this period. And this impact can be felt widely and tangibly across each of its 92 counties, as the report will show. And through the scope of our activities, IU vastly benefits Indiana by educating citizens, preventing and treating disease to improve health, enriching arts and culture, enhancing policymaking, uh, developing sustainable infrastructure, and promoting economic growth. Of, the, uh, of this nearly $10 billion total, $7 billion comes from alumni impact as alumni in the state. And one out of every 26 jobs in Indiana, the study finds, is supported by the activities of IU and its students. And this uh, $9.9 .9 billion impact supports uh, over 150,000 state jobs, which um, includes those based on direct and indirect spending using the jobs to sales ratio specific to each industry um, in the in the state as well. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Indiana has nearly 4 million total jobs um, during the analysis year where the study was carried out. And as the analysis indicates, IU supports, as I said, about 150,000 of these jobs, which translates to one out of every 26 jobs in Indiana being supported by the activities of IU and its students. Thus, if IU and its alumni did not exist, one out of every 26 jobs in Indiana similarly would not exist. And for every dollar that a student invests in their education at IU, they will receive $3.50 uh, $3 in higher future earnings. And a degree from IU provides citizens with the capacity to increase lifetime earning potential and to achieve upward social mobility. Research indicates that a well-educated workforce corresponds with improved health, lower rates of mortality, and lower overall rates of crime and poverty. Now, let me move on and, and uh, say just a few words about our fall 2020 enrollment uh, uh, figures. Going into the um, uh, start of the fall semester, in fact, going back further than that, um, uh, to when we were uh, starting to look seriously at projections uh, in April, May, we knew enrollments, we expected enrollments would be down. At uh, one point, um, uh, you, you, as you're well aware, people around the nation were predicting potential double-digit uh, reductions for college um, enrollments uh, this fall. And um, we did revise our projections of the numbers we were expecting uh, and, and crafted a, a, a careful and cautious budget uh, based on, on these revised numbers. But we're now pleased to announce that we hit all of our enrollment targets and the reduction in numbers across the university has actually been minimal overall. In fact, it's been, um, it's, 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 it's pretty much flat is, is, uh, is the answer. And, and uh, you know, to be frank, I mean, we would not have 
believe that back in uh, in April May when um, we were seeing such dire doomsday predictions uh, uh, regularly in the in the media as well. But due to an enormous amount of hard work uh, by hundreds, if not thousands, of people across the university, um, we've been able to uh, ensure that um, uh, almost exactly the same numbers that we had last year. Uh, uh, were, were the numbers that we we have this year um, as 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 well. In fact, if you take into account the significant drop in international international students, we we had a net increase uh, in um, in domestic students. The exact figure we're down is is 1.1 percent, um, and in total we now have over 90,000 degree seeking students enrolled in about um, 1.2 million credit hours. Um, which is obviously a very strong start to this academic year as well. In the last few years, we have faced um, a number of our campuses have faced the same enrollment challenges that four year colleges and universities across the country are facing. However, in this environment, as I've already indicated, I, I, I think that um, uh, even over the last few years, we've seen relatively stable in, uh, enrollment uh, as well. Now, when it comes to filling the financial pinch of this pandemic, um, IU is is no different than most Hoosier citizens and Hoosier businesses. So before we get to our request for a budget, I will uh, provide a brief overview of, of IU's um, FY 2021 budget uh, recently approved by um, our trustees and, and uh, how it has changed in recent months. Indiana University, like uh, the um, uh, the state uh, itself uh, has made um, several difficult financial decisions. Um, I'm just giving you just a, a very high level overview of some of these because the, there are there are many of them. Um, our total budget for FY21 uh, is 3.7 billion, which is a reduction of 35 million compared to um, FY20. And this reduction is due to lower tuition and fee revenue, a cut in state appropriations and reductions in other revenues like auxiliary and designated funds. One piece of the pie that I want to draw your attention to in particular is this piece here, auxiliary enterprises, which includes housing and dining, events, athletics, parking, etc. This this is one of the areas that, of course, is, is um, uh, one of the most uh, difficult and complicated for us. Auxiliary expenses cannot be reduced proportional to revenue loss and the total losses here are still unpredictable. I mean, they'll frankly be unpredictable until uh, almost the end of this academic year. We have taken dorms offline to provide quarantine and isolation housing, while expenses for the services required to clean and provide meals to the students in um, those facilities, and of course, more generally, is increasing. We're doing vastly more cleaning uh, now than, um, than we did before. And of course, uh, this is not to mention the lost revenue from athletics as well. Uh, that's what I meant about not really knowing where we'll stand until uh, later in the in the towards the end of the academic year, because um, only then will we know uh, what the outcome of um, uh, the ability to um, uh, start playing some of the sports that have been either cancelled or um, are uh, questionable at this this point as well. Um, at, at, if at any point we, we of course, uh, have to go online, totally online again, these losses will be uh, will be magnified again, especially in this area here, the auxiliary enterprises. Um, in response to this, we set budget reduction targets from the university's general fund, which is the, um, the, the largest part of the pie over here, uh, at 5% per budgetary unit. In fact, the uh, the, the campuses and units exceeded this target by by uh, 14 million. So we did 5% plus the additional amount as well. And we've taken other expense reduction and mitigation measures, including a general hiring freeze, holding um, on compensation increases for 21 financial year 21, and delaying internally funded capital projects in R and R. And these reductions and mitigation actions allow the university to have allowed the university to achieve its balanced operating budget for FY21. So um, as we continue to manage this fallout, we must also plan for the future, which of course brings us to our 2021-2023 biennial budget request. Now, as you know, of course, 
uh, operating increases are tied to performance in the funding formula. Overall, IU performed very well in the Bainium's performance funding metrics, which you can see on uh, this slide by the predominance of green. It does show up rather well. The university continues to do particularly well in overall degree completion for bachelor's degrees, on-time degree completion, including at risk on-time degree completion and in student persistence. The negative results for uh, graduate degree metrics relate to decreased enrollments in education and other academic areas and um, are most likely a result of pre uh, a previously healthy uh, economic environment in which fewer students pursued uh, an advanced degree. This We've talked about this before. I know when I presented to you, these things are counter-cyclical. When the economy is good, uh, people tend to pursue less advanced degrees, particularly of a master's type. Um, when the economy uh, is not good, um, people choose that as a time to go back to get an extra qualification to help them get a, uh, get a job. So uh, we think it's uh, possible we'll see this uh, reverse course in the next uh, the next biennium. We have some evidence of that as well. Now, on um, this line item, uh, uh, are you currently we have um, seven programs um, under the list of uh, line items, budgetary line items here, and and these programs do very important work. Um, I could talk about the IT ones, for example, uh, in in a state where uh, where so many institutions had to go online. Uh, for a large uh, amount of time, they used the iLight optical fiber infrastructure within the state, which, of course, Indiana University both um, was uh, initiated. In fact, initiated when I was still the chief information officer of the university, has continued to develop it and so on. And it is now what all higher education in the state uh, relies on. So a lot of the IT uh, line items here relate to the management and operation of a, of a large complex state-of-the-art IT infrastructure, which has been critical to enabling higher education in the state to uh, to go online. Um, and there's a number of other uh, areas there uh, related to, to the health sciences and, and uh, research as well. And of course, the uh, geological and water survey is funded through one of these line items as well. And like our operating budget, these line items were subject to the 7% cut uh, from the state in FY21. And we are not requesting any new line items for the upcoming biennium, and we are not requesting um, a typical inflationary increase as we have in the past. We understand the difficult situation the state is in, and so we are only requesting that the state hold existing line items flat at the originally appropriated FY21 levels. Now, if I can move to dual credit, as to dual credit, which is, of course, a line item for every institution that offers it. IU is the second largest provider of dual credit in the state with a program that has gained national recognition for its quality and for its high standards. IU currently supports roughly 25% of dual credit teachers statewide. And the university has a sustainable plan for continuing the support of teachers. And it is anticipated that the program will double as the Higher Learning Commission deadline um, deadline which requires all dual credit, uh, dual credit teachers to have a master's degree and at least 18 credit hours in the content area in which they teach as that deadline approaches. We ask here simply that you reinstate dual credit funding at $50 per credit hour. If I can move to, um, to capital projects, uh, we, we of course, we, we we do understand and we, we do appreciate that uh, the upcoming bicentennial biennial budget and the revenue forecast will be less optimistic than the last few budget cycles. With that in mind, we understand that capital investment may be affected. And while we are certainly mindful of the current economic situation, the university continues to evaluate and update our 10-year capital um, uh, project plan. In keeping with uh, past practices, the university submitted capital requests in accordance with our plan so that you as commission members, the governor, of course, and lawmakers are aware of our long term plans as the economy rebounds over the uh, over future years. On this slide, we've listed our top five priorities for this upcoming biennium um, and and these priorities reflect continuing investments in health sciences and research 
as well as continuing investment in renovation and rehabilitation on all of our campuses. For our purposes today, rather than go through all of these, I'm going to focus on just our first and, and top priority, the Indianapolis Academic Health Centre Medical Education and Research Facility for the IU School of Medicine. The IU School of Medicine is as I think many of you know, is the largest school of medicine in the United States, and it's the only school of medicine in Indiana that awards MDs. In 2020, physicians and scientists with the school were awarded, this was a, a new record, smash the old record, were awarded just on $550 million in research grants and awards to study, for example, the underlying causes of disease, the development of, of new therapeutics, and uh, more broadly, how to improve the uh, delivery and quality of care. Indiana University has a, has a really essential, vital partnership with IU Health that enables our research physicians to seamlessly integrate research findings that, that, that arise from the research funded by that large amount of research funding that comes from uh, funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health that enables um, the, 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 the faculty physicians to seamlessly integrate these research findings, as I said, into patient care and offer promising clinical research studies to patients close to home, like the AstraZeneca one that I'll say a few words about in a minute as well. The partnership also gives medical students the benefits of a strong integration of basic science knowledge and clinical experiences, including an emphasis on interprofessional education to prepare the next generation of healers to transform health and wellness to Indiana uh, and, and beyond. It is inter, Interprofessional education is now a vital part of education in the health sciences, not just in the School of Medicine, but in our School of Nursing, Public Health and other, other schools within the university as well. So this project here, yeah, the, 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 the research and uh, uh, education building, uh, uh, will be will will um, effectively be the construction of a new primary campus for the IU School of Medicine in conjunction with the planned expansion of uh, by IU Health at the uh, the Methodist Hospital site, this whole site here, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well. And this will create one of the largest, probably the largest hospital site in the state. The project would co-locate the medical education programs, that is the education of all of our uh, doctors at, at IU, with the research and clinical treatment facilities at IU Health that will be uh, in this building here to provide a robust learning and teaching environment. Primary research labs will remain on the medical campus adjacent uh, to IUPUI. So, so I, the IUPUI campus will have the, the um, core research laboratories or the education and clinical work, clinical research work and education work will be done uh, in this new building. And it will, as I think I've already indicated, provide opportunities for collaboration and integrated learning, including um, simulation spaces and active learning classrooms, bringing all of this together in, in one place. Of course, this hospital here replaces the present university hospital and will replace a large chunk of the present Methodist hospital as well. The project cost will be $245 million, but we're only requesting $75 million in funding from the state. That's less than a third of the total cost. The remainder of the funding will be matched more than two times over by private grants and our own IU School of Medicine funds, which we uh, have currently on hand. The Academic Health Centre is one piece of the university's continuing health and life sciences initiative and will support growth uh, in clinical research capacity and generation of research grants for, for years to come. Now, if I just move to the r, &R formula, additionally, over the last few biennia, the, the, the state's um, continued support of the r, &R formula in combination with the university funds has been crucial in the proper maintenance and repair of IU's academic facilities and infrastructure. The university has reduced its deferred maintenance backlog from over a billion dollars, which is where it was in 2010, to now um, uh, it'll be uh, just over $100 million at the end of FY uh, 2020. Um, this, uh, this, what this represents in practical terms is that that vast investment that the state has made uh, in Indiana University over 
um, certainly in terms of the physical campus, you know, nearly 150 years, that that vast investment um, is being maintained at the highest standards and is being utilised and leveraged at the most effective level possible, as opposed to becoming quasi derelict and unusable. That's what it amounts to in practical terms. And frankly, I think the Commission and I certainly think the legislature should be very proud of the fact that this is this has been accomplished and we are now able to get pretty much the total value from the state's investment in our infrastructure over more than a century as well. So um, the state's continued support of the RNR formula in combination with university funds, as I said, has been, has been vital to us. And um, we are simply requesting that the state continue to fund the current RNR formula, which totals um, just over $31 million um, over the biennium. So let me close with a, uh, a few comments about um, our uh, role in the fight against um, uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, and I want to acknowledge an important point that must underscore everything that I've laid out today. The public health landscape has changed. The economy is changing and the nature of work will be different than what we're used to. And for those reasons, it is vital that Indiana remains committed to investing in higher education in order to keep up with these changes. But higher education institutions cannot sit by as merely passive recipients of state investments. It's incumbent upon every one of us uh, to recognize that moving forward, investment from the state must result in a positive return for the state in ways that go beyond the preparation of the labor force. At IU, we've taken this um, very seriously, especially in the midst of this pandemic. And uh, while much of the presentation, much of my presentation up to this point has been a somewhat abstract look at the state's future, let me conclude by focusing now on some concrete ways in which we're helping the state weather the uh, present uh, COVID-19 storm. In, um, in previous years, I provided uh, updates on um, how IU has reorganized many of our schools to better reflect the needs of, of the state. And uh, much of this reorganization is centered around the health sciences and with state support, it truly has made IU a state and national leader uh, in this in this vital area. I, I'll, I'll just make one comment here that I think is very important because you, the commission, and quite a few of the members who are there today were, were there when this was approved. You'll remember that until we brought to you the proposal for two schools of public health, one in Indianapolis now, the Fairbanks School of Public Health, and one in Bloomington. Indiana as a state did not have any schools of public health. And I think even based on what you see in the media every day, the impact in particular of the Fairbanks School on, on the public health issues uh, that have arisen because of COVID-19 have, uh, have been enormous, have been extremely significant, and they continue to be as both schools of public health provide constant advice and have been involved in initiating um, studies that have been extremely important to understand uh, the epidemiology of, of uh, COVID-19 in the state. That would not have happened had you not approved our request for those two schools of public health now, I believe, about seven, eight years ago when we first brought those to you. So that's very tangible impact of the investment and the and and the um, approval on establishment of uh, of those schools as well. Of course, as I noted before, IU is home to the largest medical school in the country with medical education campuses in nearly every region of the state. And in addition to providing clinical care in a variety of, of settings, our School of Medicine is contributing to, uh, I think, the, the world's collective knowledge about uh, COVID-19 um, and its numerous yet um, unsolved uh, mysteries. Uh, uh, I think this is clearly a virus uh, the, 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 where scientists are still only scratching the surface of their understanding about it as well. Now, among other projects, we have um, world-class researchers studying the human uh, pulmovirus, uh, HPV, um, who recognize the epidemiology of HPV and COVID-19 are in fact very similar and quickly pivoted their work into leading research on how the coronavirus spread. Our clinical researchers have been at the forefront of testing various convalescent therapies, such as blood uh, plasma transfusions and um, hydroxychloroquine uh, as well. 
And just last week, of course, the Commissioner uh, kindly mentioned before, AstraZeneca made the major announcement that our School of Medicine would be one of the test sites and the only one in Indiana and research partner for the phase three trial for their COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine, uh, which was originally developed at the uh, Fleming um, Institute at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Once um, uh, this trial resumes, of course, it is not, as I think people would have seen from multiple media reports, including Dr. Fauci, uh, it is not unusual for a phase three trial, given the scale of them, uh, to be to be halted with that many people. Uh, people will get sick and they need to determine what the relationship of that is to the vaccine, if any. So um, uh, we fully, uh, the, the Dean dean of Medicine, who actually happens to be a virologist, uh, fully expects that trial will resume um, uh, at some point soon. This makes, of course, IU and indeed the entire state, one of the global epicenters for developing a vaccine that might help us emerge from a state of pandemic lockdown. Along with the medical school, IU is home to, as I noted before, the only two schools of public health in the state. And uh, one um, in Bloomington here uh, has a focus on public health in rural areas, and the, in fact, the Fairbanks School has a focus on public health in urban areas. And this, as I said already, has positioned us very well to be in the front lines of local responses to the coronavirus across the state. From advising local health departments uh, through the OCRA partnership with the IU Centre for Rural Engagement and the IU School of Public Health in Bloomington, to conducting the first statewide random sample testing program in the nation for the State Department of Health through um, the Fairbanks School of, of Public Health at IEPUI, a study that's got an enormous amount of attention, to setting up contact tracing operations which were in fact based on our global health program's experience in doing contact tracing in Africa. The head of contact tracing for the university, the director of contact uh, tracing for the university at, at the um, uh, at, at the university is was the um, the the director of uh, the Ampath program and the and the director of contact tracing for Ampath in uh, in Kenya as well. So brought all that expertise directly to our contact tracing program at uh, at the moment. And of course, there's the training of the vast majority of doctors and nurses working around the clock these past six months. Of course, that was that many of those, the vast majority of them come from Indiana University as well. So I think this has all provided a huge return for Hoosiers on the state's previous investments as well. And if I can just expand a little beyond that as well, IU's work in collaboration with the state also extends beyond the direct pandemic response as we have helped local communities and businesses deal with many of the indirect impacts. For example, the, the um, IU's uh, renowned Kelly School of Business partnered with the Indiana Small Business Development Centers, the um, Economic Development Centers, the Chambers of Commerce and the Business Hubs to offer no cost business assistance to businesses who want to shift their operations online. And finally, the um, uh, uh, the uh, I, I should mention the uh, the uh, our, our grand challenge uh, project here um, ad addressing opioid addiction. Uh, we have a team that is specially studying the management of substance abuse disorder uh, during the pandemic, uh, as these rates have increased sadly by somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 percent as well. And finally, the um, the IU. Uh, high school uh, project offers online instruction and has shared its curriculum with schools across Indiana to help transition to remote uh, teaching and learning. So these are just a, uh, a handful of, um, so as I said, these are just a, a handful of numerous examples of how IU is benefiting the state today and how we are focusing on helping the state moving forward. The world has changed quite a bit since March and it is going to change quite a bit more in the coming years. And the, and and this commission, you commissioners, um, was I think uh, maybe more prescient than you realised when you launched a strategic plan that was called Reaching Higher in the State of Change, um, given the amount of change that is now happening. And of course, we commit as a as a major uh, uh, internationally renowned research university to assist our state. In confronting that challenge and and the and the changes that uh, that we are even now grappling with ourselves and and with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.
We will have time for just a few. Can you hear no me? Question. Trying, I'm figuring it out. I'm sort of trying. I email Kat. No. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Well, there's so much there that it's hard to figure out what kind of a question to answer. It sounds like uh, the IU is uh, they're adjusting to the, uh, the reduced enrollment and the fact that we're not going to have as much money yet uh, carrying on in a rather impressive way. So uh, I don't really have any questions, uh, but I'm impressed with everything that's going on. The uh, uh, my gosh, uh, that that statistic that we have more Pell grants than all the Ivy League put together. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. So uh, yes, it is. We're, yes. uh, we're certainly attacking that yep. uh, equity position with, yep. you know, we gotta, we gotta make the uh, opportunity at this time special. Hey, I'm gonna move us on. Th President right. McRobbie, we are um, very cool. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Chairman Pitts, we can yes. make sure before we move on, I need to make sure that everybody is muting your phones. If you're not talking, if you are asking a question, if you'll, uh, start by saying who's asking the question so our guests will make sure they'll know who they're talking to as well because we're having a little bit I know Liz is working to make sure we have as good a reception as we possibly can but we want to make sure that we're helpful to the people who are making presentations and I would just conclude again by saying to President McRobbie that you know um, it's a source of pride for you I know to make this kind of a presentation and it is for us to hear it as well so thank you very much thank you yes. thank you commissioners yes and we are ready to move on forward. And now we will hear from Indiana State University. And I'm very pleased to introduce President Deborah Curtis. Let's see if we're um, camera, camera needs adjusted. Uh oh, uh, let us adjust. Hmm. Slow but sure. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Greetings. Great. Greetings, Hello, President President Curtis. Curtis. How are you? Good. Go right I hope, ahead. I Go hope ahead. everyone is well. I'm bringing you greetings from the beautiful campus of Indiana State University today, where we're really looking forward to chatting with you today. Uh, but keeping in mind, of course, with that said, we look forward to the time when we can conduct commission business in person again. So we, we're looking forward to that. It's especially nice for me to see Ann Bowen who is the first student from ISU to serve on the commission in a very long time. We're delighted to have her in that service role. I think you're gonna find she's a wonderful young professional who's going to do big things in her career. We are uh, at the end, coming to the end of 2020 here at Indiana State. We're about to wrap our sesquicentennial celebration. So we've been able to reflect a little bit about these last 150 years. And shortly after the US Civil War, a state legislator named <clears throat> Baskin Rhodes from Vermilion County introduced legislation that created the Indiana State Normal School. Citizens of Terre Haute then petitioned the city council for a local appropriation of $50,000 to purchase land and construct our first facility. The normal school would become Indiana State Teachers College, Indiana State College, and today we are Indiana State University. Over the past 150 years, our university has endured the hardships of a fire that destroyed the main building, a flu pandemic, the Great Depression, two world wars, of course, the current pandemic, and periods of social injustice. But there have been far more positive experiences as we fulfill our mission to our state by transforming the lives of students who come to ISU and we thank you so much for the commission's support. 150 years from now, people will look back and wonder how COVID-19 impacted our lives. Our message is that Indiana State University never closed and never operated out of fear. We followed the pragmatic guidance of the State Department of Health, and we embraced the governor's call to manage through this pandemic. Here you will see two sets of information. On the left are examples of how ISU has been managing. On the right, you will see the impact of COVID-19 on our operations and finances. 
We experienced a higher than usual summer amount of students who had initially committed to attend ISU but decided to defer enrollment. In fact, we saw a 57% increase in students deferring admissions to a future start term. The enrollment impact along with the necessity of the state to implement a 7% appropriation reserve has impacted ISU in several ways. We implemented internal budget reductions, we deferred maintenance, we delayed filling positions and eliminated a planned salary increase. As well, we eliminated vacant positions wherever possible. We are committed to affordability because our students cannot afford to pay more in tuition. Therefore, we are a lean organization that operates on a narrow margin. Our people are working very hard and we are weathering these challenges. We look forward to an economic recovery that we are confident is in our near future. ISU, like all colleges and university, pays close attention to demographic trends. Here is the challenge. The enrollment pipeline of high school graduates is declining and is expected to decline for several more years. Given the demographic changes, it's more important than ever to communicate the value proposition that an ISU degree provides. We are familiar with headlines like these. The narrative on higher education throughout the nation calls into question the actual worth of college. And this was before COVID-19. Often the narrative questions the college experience and value when compared to the cost of college and the ability of college graduates to land jobs in their respective fields. The pandemic crisis has augmented these concerns and it's quite possible that some colleges and universities may not survive. Well, ISU will. For ISU, the challenge means doubling down on demonstrating who we are, who we serve, and what we do best. This is our value proposition, or in other words, why Indiana State University is worth it. It's about providing opportunity to those who seek higher education. It's about ensuring the quality of our academic programs that meet the same rigorous accreditation as academic programs found elsewhere at a higher cost to students and their families. It's about affordability because no one should be priced out of attending college and fulfilling a dream. It's about an outcome. And for us, the outcome is student success, graduation and starting that career. Our value proposition is fulfilled as we carry out our mission built upon a culture of inclusion. ISU is embarking on its next strategic plan, which is a time to take stock of where we are and chart our future. As with our previous strategic plans, this next plan will continue to align with the strategic plan of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education with a focus on completion, equity, and talent. I especially want to reinforce the importance of equity, which has been embraced by ISU since our founding. It's embedded in our cultural DNA, and we deliver on the promotion of equity through action. We also remain mindful of the collective big goal to inspire our fellow Indiana citizens to continue their education and increase their skills by earning a credential beyond high school. It is never too late to do this. Provided here is a snapshot of who we are. Many of you have heard me say that Indiana State University is the state of Indiana's university. We continue to experience strong numbers of 21st century scholars, first generation college attendees, Pell eligible students, and individuals from minority communities. The average GPA of incoming freshmen continues to rise, which is a strong indicator of college success. We're very proud to report continued improvement in first year retention, which is now at 69%, a seven percentage point improvement from two years ago. A couple of years ago, we shared that ISU was working to be more careful and intentional in its approach to admissions to increase student success. We may tr remain true to our mission of being an opportunity university in the state of Indiana. Our goal is so much more than just attracting students to ISU. It's seeing our students walk across the stage at graduation. Last year, we forged a new partnership with Ivy Tech beginning this fall called Pathway to Blue. 
Many students who did not meet our minimum admissions requirements a few years ago might have been conditionally admitted to ISU and were less likely to be successful in college. Today, those students are able to start at Ivy Tech while participating in ISU residential and student life. We are absolutely confident that this will increase student success as we develop co-academic advising, community events, and other support programs to provide another pathway to a four-year degree. I mentioned earlier the importance of equity to ISU. We believe the recognition displayed here is one of the most important benchmarks that should capture your attention and the attention of our fellow citizens. ISU has been validated by external entities such as College Net as being the best university in Indiana for social mobility. ISU is the intersection where individuals from very different backgrounds and challenges come to better their lives. Some come from urban areas, some come from rural settings. Many are the first to go to college and have little idea about the endless possibilities that one can achieve with an ISU degree. There's a network of sycamores who open doors of opportunity to so many. This is the very epitome of the American dream built upon a vibrant middle class of citizens who fill the job ranks in Indiana, pay their taxes in Indiana, volunteer in Indiana, and become community leaders in our great state. How do we know how well our graduates are doing? Well, we ask them. ISU was one of the first universities to fully engage in first destination surveys. And each year we prove that ISU is worth it. The data from the class of 2019 is astounding. 99% of our graduates found a job in their field of study, are attending graduate school or serving our country in the armed forces. Nearly seven out of 10 remain in Indiana with an average starting salary of over $57,000. This is why state makes sense. We know that COVID-19 will impact next year's data, but we also know, like you know, that those earning the ISU degree will fare better than those without it. We emphasize first destination because we all know that life is an ongoing journey filled with opportunities and challenges. Many of the challenges are beyond our control, recessions, globalization, outsourcing of jobs, new technologies, automation, a global pandemic, these are all real life and real time factors that impact how and if Americans will work. And while we're proud of all of our programs, we like especially to uplift our distinctive programs that are fully aligned with the workforce priorities and needs of Indiana. We're so appreciative that Governor Holcomb asked Commissioner Lubbers to chair the workforce cabinet. She gets it and understands how and why higher education must continue to evolve and do an even better job addressing the workforce needs, which in turn helps our state compete in a fast changing global economy. One might first chuckle over the notion of finding oneself in college, but the fact is very, very few people really know what they want to do when they grow up. Young people are influenced in so many ways and often have little insight about the myriad career opportunities that are endless. Many arrive at ISU thinking about one field of study and then learn about other exciting career opportunities, including the programs listed on this slide. They also learn more about themselves, their strengths and their interests. I'd like to introduce you to Maya Jamison, who transferred to ISU. Maya thought she wanted to be a biologist and then discovered a passion for business and accounting. Here's her story. So I started out in my freshman year as a cellular and molecular biology major. That was clearly not the best fit, and I transferred almost immediately. <laughs> I was just thinking about like, what, what am I good at, and uh, how can I like excel, and what do I actually want to do in the future? And you know, I've always been like very business savvy, but in between the two years, I got an internship with Ernst and Young, and it's an accounting firm. Right, and then I figured out that I actually wanted to continue doing what I was doing at the firm. And so in order to do that, I needed to get more into my major. And so I started to learn the things that would actually, I would actually use in the field. They noticed that, okay, I was more knowledgeable about what I was actually doing. And I kind of wasn't just following orders, but 
I was comprehending like what those orders actually meant and what I was contributing to the company. I was primarily in the uh, BCM practice, so the banking capital market. In that sector, I would go to banks and we would audit them. And with that, they actually offered me a full-time job at Nassim Young. So Indiana State for me is, it kind of represents like a second chance. It has a higher accreditation. Um, I think the professors are at that level. And so it was kind of an adjustment because um, I'm learning so much more about these subjects that I wasn't learning at my previous school. And like having to meet their level, I love it. You know, it's, it's kind of a challenge and their mentality, they still care about you and everything, but they also want you to know that, okay, this is what you're gonna, is required of you and you need to meet these expectations. And so, I mean, I love the atmosphere and I love the professors here personally. We are so proud of Maya. Her story serves as a microcosm of the Sycamore educational experience that includes experiential learning opportunities that lead to internships and job offers. At ISU, Maya recognized her strengths and passions. She then grew in her field of study and landed an internship with a national firm upon graduation. Maya is now employed with that firm and has an incredible future ahead of her. This is what ISU delivers every day. We continue to ask ourselves, what are those jobs that tend to be resilient against economic downturns, outsourcing to foreign countries and automation? Healthcare continues to be the sector with strong in-demand job opportunities. We're so grateful for the commission's past support to develop and grow these health and wellness programs. The graduates of these programs become the essential workers in healthcare. They're part of the solution to increase access to healthcare throughout the state of Indiana. In addition to our programs that are focused on workforce needs, ISU provides a tremendous economic impact to local, regional, and state economies. We commissioned an external review of our economic impact, and you will see impressive numbers, including a $475 million statewide impact, over $400 million in campus construction over the past 12 years, 5,000 jobs supported by the university, 76,000 visitors drawn to the region by the university. We also provide added value through the nearly 700,000 hours of community service work our students provide each year. Indiana State serves as the arts and cultural hub for West Central Indiana and East Central Illinois and regularly hosts several high profile events such as the NCAA Cross Country Championships and the Indiana Special Olympics. Here's a snapshot, a 50,000 foot look at the sources of our funding. We're so grateful for the state's support. Yet one of my priorities as president of ISU is to grow philanthropic support. We are not yet, yet blessed with the large endowments that other institutions have, but we are working hard to bolster private support, particularly scholarship support. We thought this would be the clearest and easiest way to demonstrate our ongoing commitment to affordability. ISU remains the most affordable option compared to other universities in Indiana that serve a residential statewide mission. And we thought it would be helpful for you to see how we compared institutions out of state with similar missions to ISU. Having spent a significant part of my career in Illinois, I can say that there is not the same level of state commitment or ability to honor a commitment to higher education in Illinois compared to Indiana. Because of the state support of ISU and because we take seriously our charge to be good stewards of the funding received, we can offer our unique experience that is affordable. As each university operates differently depending on size and mission, it's clear ISU has been and remains committed to a lean and very efficient operational system talked earlier about the impacts to our finances and operations due to COVID-19. Here are some other unavoidable costs that increase annually. As we maintain the high quality educational experience, these will always be challenges for an institution like ISU. The Commission for Higher Education, rightly so, has placed greater emphasis on student performance, including degree completion and retention. 
We embrace performance funding and we continue to believe that the persistence requirements on programs such as the 21st Century Scholars Program have helped with improved retention rates at ISU. This table is evidence of our continued improvement on student performance metrics. I'd like to point out though two observations for your consideration. The first relates to the approach of allocating dollars from one institution to another. We have stated before our preference for an approach that does not require reallocation, given that each of our institutions serve different missions and different populations of students. We're especially worried that reallocating dollars right now, while we all are dealing with the budgetary impacts due to the pandemic, put additional financial stress on ISU. It also puts all of the public higher education in a precarious position exactly when the state is counting on us the most. The other observation I would make is that a few years down the road as the commission looks at student persistence and completion data for funding purposes, we hope the commission will also take into account COVID-19. ISU is not alone in having to enforce some conduct expectations as it relates to public health practices. We have removed students for unhealthy behaviors that have put others on campus at risk. These actions may negatively impact the performance data that we will have to report in future years. Also, some students start the semester and become overwhelmed with that anxiety, due in part to the endless media and social media narratives that drop out, despite all of our efforts to be supportive. As the commission is thinking about the short and long-term performance funding formulas, we ask that ISU and our other public institutions not be penalized for things that are far beyond our control due to this pandemic. As ISU has had to pause important campus commitments and functions because of the COVID-19 impact to our budget, we respectfully ask that the state pause in performance funding reallocation. There are three line items for which we seek continued support. All three are examples the state of Indiana requested ISU to undertake. The first is the Indiana Principal Leadership Institute, which was created with bipartisan support during a time when there was not a lot of bipartisan agreement on K-12 educational issues. Legislators such as Luke Kenley, Jim Banks, Earlene Rogers, Wendy McNamara, and Sue Arrington worked together to advance this initiative because they agreed with ISU that leadership matters in our public schools. And they agreed that Indiana State University's by College of Education needed to be the home of IPLI. On this slide, you're able to see the tremendous impact that IPLI has had in Indiana. Degree Link is an example of lever leveraging limited state funding to advance higher education opportunities to place bound citizens who are not in a position in life to attend college in person on a campus. As te technology has evolved, so too has the operational function supporting Degree Link. We believe that this continues to be a strong tool for us to continue our growing efforts to attract the non traditional learner and further develop Indiana's talent pipeline. The nursing line item supports ISU's work to help the state with the ever present challenge of building the nursing capacity of Indiana. We have known through demographic analysis that as more baby boomer nurses age and retire, coupled with the dramatic increase in the need for health care by an aging population, tremendous strains are being felt in the nursing profession. Again, the small investment by the state helps ISU make a big impact through our nursing program, which is one of our strongest on campus and online programs. When thinking about university capital projects, especially during times of financial stress, it's important to remember that universities serve as excellent conduits for state investment that directly impacts local economies. Construction on the ISU campus, as you will recall from our economic impact slide, has provided much needed work to those in the construction trades, which in turn provides work to other businesses, such as supplier, transportation and trucking providers, and service industries. And all of these jobs are in Indiana. As with our previous capital requests, 
we factor a number of considerations, particularly the greatest workforce needs of the state based on competitiveness, workforce demand, and the skills needed for high paying jobs. We also ask ourselves, what will work look like in the coming decades? Brookings published last year a disturbing report that listed Indiana as the most vulnerable to job losses due to automation and artificial intelligence. Meantime, countries around the world are competing with Indiana to take jobs long held by our citizens. We live in a world that is increasingly dependent on the Internet of Things as technology impacts every sector. This month's National Geographic is focused on robots and healthcare, manufacturing, farming, and food service. The takeaway from the article is the speed with which employers are dropping robots into the lives of their workers and that some workers will have a much harder time adapting. This brings us to our capital priority, the ISU Engineering and Manufacturing Center located in the Technology Building. As with most of ISU's capital budget requests, this is a special renovation of an existing facility. The Technology Building was constructed in 1980 when technology meant calculators and a limited number of computers that were the size of an entire room. Educational facilities have needed to change because work has changed in the United States. The Wall Street Journal headline from December 9th of 2019 captures what we are seeing, that within three years, U.S. manufacturing workers with college degrees will outnumber those without. If we don't provide that workforce pipeline to fill those high paying jobs, other states and indeed other countries will. The result will be loss of investment in Indiana as companies will go where the workers are. The Engineering and Manufacturing Center houses academic programs that support the pipeline to high demand jobs, including those listed here. Most facilities across the country that support science, technology, engineering, and math specialties are seldom inexpensive, but we've committed ourselves to making a reasonable request for a much needed facility that will provide a tremendous long-term return on investment. We need more workers in these fields, and through this investment, ISU will be able to do what we do best, educate students in these areas who are likely to remain in Indiana to live and work. Finally, we often see and appreciate Commissioner Lovers advocating for the 21st Century Scholars Program, and we forcefully advocate for this as well. ISU has the highest percentage of Indiana residents who are 21st century scholars, and we're so proud of them. The program has enjoyed bipartisan support, and a few years ago on the ISU campus, former Governor Mike Pence announced that the program would be named for the leader who championed it years ago, former Governor Evan Bayh. We also want to acknowledge former Commissioner Stan Jones for his strong contributions to this program. Indiana will not reach the big goal without our 21st century scholars, and we appreciate the continued support for this important program that serves as a societal contract between our state and its young citizens. I want to conclude by reminding you of our vision. Indiana State University is doing great things as we keep Indiana and our fellow citizens first and foremost in everything that we do. The happiest part of my job is seeing our students cross the stage of commencement and begin a lifetime of unlimited opportunities right here in Indiana. This is what we are about at Indiana State University, and we are eternally grateful for your support. Thank you and go Sycamores. Happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you so much. We are open for some questions. We have a little time for questions and comments. Uh, I, guess I, get, I guess I have a question regarding uh, your comments about the uh, performance funding and, and the possibility of uh, moving monies around. We, we've done this before in the, in, the uh, in the throes of a recession uh, a number of years ago when it worked out pretty well in the long term. Um, and aren't we, one of the things we're looking at as a commission is the way dollars are spread across the state to meet the state's objectives, not any one school's objectives. And yet we've set up 
performance metrics sensitive to the differences and the missions of each schools. And there are percentage changes in those that are looked at as opposed to absolutes. Why, why do you say that you think that we ought not to approach it that way? Looking at it as a whole, I understand why it may, one school may lose out versus another. But when we look at taking uh, limited dollars from the state and figuring out how, how those are allocated, knowing that we're trying to get certain objectives met, long-term goals met, how would we otherwise do that? I'm not sure I'm suggesting another model for later. I am really suggesting that in this time, at this time with the challenges we have, and I'm gonna go back to our challenges, our margin is so very small in delivering our services, and we do not have the backboard of large endowments to be able to support our work. We're so committed to meeting the needs of the state that we are just asking temporarily that this shifting of resources not take place, which would incredibly damage our ability to continue to do our work. Would there, I guess I'd ask, would that would there be a different approach as opposed to say, saying just to delay or not, not do anything this year? Shouldn't we look at the impact of COVID on various schools and maybe say, is there some way to adjust for that? Um, you know, how do we, it's hard for us to figure out how to make that work. Well, certainly that could be something to be studied. There's no doubt about that. Okay, I'm just going to respectfully restate what I mentioned is that we just ask for a temporary pause till we get through the COVID piece, and that would allow us some time to study what might be a better model. I will volunteer to be a part of those discussions because indeed those differences amongst institutions are a challenge. Thank you. Um, a question, this, this, uh, this is Al Hubbard, uh, more of a comment. Well, I, I, I uh, first off, is just to follow up on what Chris Murphy's questions, I, I'm been very supportive and I think it's been very impactful and very helpful, the whole performance funding. So I would be very cautious about changing it. Um, and, uh, but I would like to just, uh, I, I, I'm, I was so delighted to hear you talk about uh, uh, being careful about who y'all admit and making sure that the people who are admitted are qualified to do the work and that you're now working with Ivy Tech. So those who aren't can go to Ivy Tech first. And then, you know, if they are, the, uh, if it's appropriate for them to then move on to, to Indiana State. I, I just think that's so important. Uh, I, I've, I've, I know we are all very concerned about uh, students who don't succeed and leave. And these, and I love the fact that, you know, almost 50% of your students are first generation. Uh, uh, they are not financially strong. Uh, you have done a great job of keeping your tuition down. Uh, but the worst thing that we can do is for them to come for a year, a year and a half, and end up with a bunch of debt and then leave with, with, without any degree. And that's, I'm just, I just want to uh, thank you for being focused on that. And uh, uh, I was delighted you made it a big part of your presentation. Well, I also want to say thank you for that comment because between me and, uh, and my work with the provost and academic affairs and enrollment management, the two of us have taken a very careful look at that. And you are saying my words. There's nothing worse than inviting someone in who's not prepared, saddling them with debt, and then they leave in a semester or two. And they're likely not going to find their way back to that process later on. So we're eternally grateful for the work with Ivy Tech here in Terre Haute in figuring out how we do this better, making that seamless transition smooth for students. I keep call it, calling it lighting their runway. Everyone's runway may start in a different spot, but lighting it for them to see here is your best path, best path and making that possible. So thank you for that comment. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you for uh, continuing to work so well with students who uh, really need the kind of support that you give, and uh, we appreciate all the things that you've presented to us today. Thank, thank you for being with us. Thank you. I wanted to apologize real quickly for the earlier transition. My computer glitched on me, and I had to switch to a different device, so I had a little bit of chaos there, but we're back on. Uh, leave it.
to technology. I hate to be the one that got messed up, but I think we're okay. We're ready to move forward and uh, recognize President Ronald Rojan from the um, in University of Southern Indiana. We're very happy to have him with us and we'll turn it over to him. Thank you very much. I just wanted to thank each of the commissioners and uh, thank you Commissioner Lovers for, well, let me just again, thank you all for uh, this opportunity uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm excited about speaking to you about the University of Southern Indiana and where we are uh, with regard to our 2021-2023 uh, 20, uh, biennial, biennial request. Uh, I wanna start off with a, a slide that's going to um, let me just pull up our slides. I want to start off with a slide that's going to actually just just really communicate two words um, to you all, and that's uh, that's thank you to everyone uh, for the kinds of support that you have provided to to our university. This year marks the first budget request made by the University of Southern Indiana following the death of our founding president, Dr. David L. Rice. Uh, this year we had his wife Betty on campus with his family, and we were able to celebrate his life and his legacy. Uh, on this slide, you see simply a picture of Dr. Rice pointing at a schematic, uh, really kind of a vision, a dream of what USI could look like. In fact, if, if the commission and others across the state would actually invest and believe in this possibility. Uh, this legacy, as you know, has come to fruition because of your investment in us. And I wanna just thank the women and men who came long before me and Dr. Rice for his courage, his vision, his work and his legacy. We, the University of Southern Indiana, appreciate the financial support shown to USI. We appreciate the recommendation of line items which have allowed us to better support Indiana's educational mission. We appreciate the recognition of efforts and successes in producing graduates serving the workforce goals of the great state of Indiana. And also we appreciate the capital projects and initiatives that have allowed us to develop key academic programs all across this university. So I simply say two important words to everyone, thank you. I move over to uh, give you a sense of the profile of our student body. Um, we have um, really been very effective at attracting uh, stronger and stronger students each and every year. Over the past several years, though, we have focused on increasing our intentional um, effort of also partnering with Ivy Tech and identifying students who are not only college ready, but, but are really serious about successful matriculation. While USI has improved our, the academic profiling of our incoming students, we've also identified ways in which higher education has changed the landscape as it pertains to, to standardized exams. And so for this uh, academic year coming forward, we will um, bypass the SAT and ACT scores, uh, providing students an opportunity to focus on other, other components for admissions criteria. We will continue to look at multiple facets of a student's academic record. Um, we're looking at high school curriculum, GPA, of course, grades earned in academic coursework, the strength of those courses that are taken, uh, performance in honors, dual credit, and also AP courses. We will still allow students who are really interested in submitting an ACT or SAT score to do so, and that, that will be a part of their consideration as well. But we're excited about finding ways in which we can create greater access to Hoosiers that are considering USI as their campus of choice. This slide right here just demonstrates very clearly who we are, who we're attracting, and how effective we have been. In the fall of 2019, 41% of all enrolled students are from the surrounding counties of Vandenberg, Posey, Warwick, and Gibson County, while a total of roughly 80% of the entire university population at USI are actually homegrown students from 90 different counties across the state. We have more than 44,000 living alumni, and of those alumni, 70% of them live in the state of Indiana, and 78% of that number reside in Southwest Indiana. Uh, we have also been working very closely with, with regional employers and, and uh, economic leaders to find out exactly what our graduates would need to best serve their organizations and their businesses. And so to have USI partnering with these people across the state, but also in Southwest Indiana in particular, has been very, very exciting for us. This slide right here speaks very closely, you know, to the kinds of responses you all know too well. COVID-19 has impacted every single campus across the nation, uh, Indiana in particular, with regard to how we respond. We have been extremely methodical. We've been very intentional at bringing at the forefront of every thought, every policy, every behavior about the safety of our faculty, our staff, and our student body. And so these 
these uh, these points right here just really kind of indicate them, some things that are quite obvious to you. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you also knew that we listened to our students um, prior to coming back this fall, and overwhelmingly, our student body had indicated a very strong need and a desire to have face-to-face -face interaction with our faculty. And so we worked hard as a campus community to provide as much of that possibility um, moving forward. And so I tell you all today that we have 69% of our classes currently are either face-to-face -face and or hybrid combined. Uh, this, is ex this is extremely unique. Um, but we're excited and we know this is a marathon. We are celebrating each and every day that we're successful in doing so. But I wanted to take a moment to thank our faculty in particular who have been responsive, who have really risen to this occasion of listening to our students, but also responding to their desired needs. This slide really kind of speaks to our, our strategic planning. Um, USI is now in its third iteration of a strategic plan. Uh, I am excited to tell you that we have uh, been very successful with the first two plans, but this plan we've taken a, a bit of a different route with regard to not only its uh, development, but also its future layout. We have uh, over 2,600 employees, retirees, and students that are engaged in developing ideas, providing input and direction with regard to how this plan should not only be developed, but the direction we should go in as a university community. I want to thank specifically uh, Commissioner Lovers. Uh, she, she came to campus right after I became president and began to share with me and my team about what she was doing with her new plan. And uh, Commissioner Lovers, I want to tell you that we've worked very, very hard to, to not only partner with the commission, but also to pay very, very close attention to the direction that you have been going in uh, with, regard to, um, with regard to the commission itself. And I, I think that once I'm able to come back to you, or once we've had this fully vetted and endorsed by our trustees, I'll be able to show you some similarities and also even greater partnerships with regard to how we are moving forward with our, our new plan as an institution. The performance metrics are obvious to you all. You know them backwards and forwards. I won't read them to you, but I will tell you this right here, that USI continues to demonstrate improvement in all of the commission's performance metrics. We appreciate that the commission has put considerable time and effort in developing these student-centered metrics that encourage a focus on vital areas across the academy. And so I want to thank you all in advance. I'm going to provide you just a really quick snippet and understanding of how we have uh, matriculated and, and moved toward specific goals as pertains to each of, the, each of the metrics. I'll start with overall degree completion. The overall bachelor degree completion for Indiana residents has increased 12.3% over the past 10 years to the current total of, a, of over 1,301 uh, graduates. The number of master's and doctoral degrees earned by Indiana residents has increased 79% from the same 10-year span. And changes to our modality has increased the online offerings for us. I have been traveling the state meeting alumni from USI, and it's been exciting to hear from them directly with regard to the impact of our online delivery. One example, um, I traveled to Jasper, Indiana. I met with uh, several alumni there, and just to hear Women in particular, moms and full-time employees talking about the relevant curriculum that has been, been provided through our MBA program has been exciting. Um, they're talking about not only uh, the significance of, of convenience, but again, the relevance so that they can actually matriculate successfully and advance themselves professionally. And so getting that feedback uh, from them has been, has been actually music to my ears as I talk to the faculty and talk to our provost about additional opportunities we can provide moving moving forward. Our on-time graduation rate continues to make progress as well in the four-year student completion rate. The number of on-time degrees completed has increased 61.9% since 2010-2011, and while our on-time graduation rate has more than doubled in that same 10-year span. At the University of Southern Indiana, tuition and fees also is something I need to mention. For full-time in-state undergraduate students, remain the most affordable of the four-year residential universities in the entire state. And this right here speaks boldly not only about our effort and our ability to deliver, but it also goes back to one of the, what, what, what one of the commissioners has already mentioned, and that's student debt, keeping our student debt to a minimal. At-risk degree completion is something that we are seeing um, a, a great improvement in as well. This metric has doubled during the current three-year comparison period. However, I will tell you though, as a campus community, we're still not, still not satisfied. We are working hard to bring um, greater attention to this area and also bring greater success. 
In fact, there's a program that I'm going to speak to you all about in, in, a, in a few minutes called the Strong Start to Completion Program, one that I mentioned at the last biennial period that I'd like to revisit with you today. Our STEM degree completion program is something that I'm excited about also. We have intensified our focus on helping to meet Indiana's goals in STEM completion. Um, we have partnered with PK-12 uh, schools and teachers and administrators to, to assist in the foundation in STEM disciplines through our Southwest Indiana Resource Center. This is a nationally recognized program and it allows us to provide lending materials to, to communities. We actually have a relationship with 17 different counties across the state of Indiana where we are providing um, uh, the kinds of resources necessary to, to open the eyes of students, of young people, to see what is actually available for them when it comes to STEM disciplines. Uh, one other um, quick mention that I, I'm excited about, I, I had spoken about this at our, at our last gathering, was the Unite CubeSat um, opportunity that was developed in our engineering program. This was a partnership with NASA, and uh, we are i um, excited about the fact that, you know, that our undergraduate students have developed a satellite that is designed, built, and maintained entirely by undergraduate students at the University of Southern Indiana. Uh, it's, it was launched in 2019, right before the legislative session. I should also let you know that of all of the CubeSats that have been launched, 25% of CubeSats are deemed lost immediately upon deployment, and the majority fail to maintain power throughout their mission. USI satellite is still active, still collecting data, and uh, I'm excited about that. And it's just a true testament, you know, to our to our students, our undergraduate students, and their intellectual development. It's a true testament to our faculty in that department who have committed themselves to the development of these students. But also, to me, it's a true testament to the commission for believing in USI and having the ability to not only create an engineering program, but have one that is going to be uh, a bragging point for the entire state. Student persistence, um, listen, I'll, I'll tell you right now, if you know anything about USI, you know anything about our DNA, about our history, about Dr. Rice and his colleagues, you think persistence. Our 30, 60, and 90 credit hour um, um, has increased over the three-year comparison as well. And I need you to, you to know that persistence is something that's always on my mind, always on the mind of USI. In fact, I have charged every human being on this campus, regardless of, of rank or title, that we, beginning with the president, is first and foremost a recruitment and retention officer at this university. I don't care what you're doing, but what we do and how we do it, how we engage and interact with students will determine whether or not they bring their, their siblings, they bring their neighbors, they bring their, their, their relatives. Uh, we have been focused on persistence at every level. So based upon the data that I've just demonstrated, this helps you to understand that USI, again, has demonstrated positive outcomes in all of the performance funding metrics. Assuming that we had a, fund, a fully funded formula by the legislative body, USI's uh, performance funding um, would total increase uh, would be roughly $6.5 million. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you right now, that kind of money for an institution like the University of Southern Indiana is transformational. Uh, it allows us to do even more than what we've done before that allows us to partner even more effectively with the commission to carry out the expectations that you have laid before each of the public institutions. And so I'm just ask, you know, to, to please consider the, the significance of these kinds of dollars and its enhancement of our ability to do great work for the state. I mentioned also very quickly that um, USI has not been able to provide raises over the last three years. Dr. Bennett, as she exited the presidency, and now I've been in office for two years, we have hardworking, deserving people who have not been able to enjoy uh, a raise in their salary over the last few years. And I just wanted to let you know that, again, these kinds of resources will assist us in uh, providing the kinds of necessary changes and enhancements uh, for this institution. I now move from performance funding to our specific request for the, for the uh, biennium period uh, and our existing line items. The university requests continued and increased funding of the current line item appropriation for historic New Harmony to support the preservation, education, and interpretive programs of the state and national treasure. The line item appropriation for New Historic New Harmony has only been increased once in the past decade, which followed a prior more substantial cut. This year's request would restore Historic New Harmony's operating appropriation to nearly the same level that it was back in 2008 in 2009. 
Uh, the university also requests a return to full funding for dual credit priority courses for the 21-23 biennium period. The program has continued to grow over the past decade. And also the university and the legislative, uh, as we know, places great importance on dual, dual credit programs. CAP allows students to become more college ready, something that was spoken to right before my presentation, and earns credits before coming to campus, reduces student, st student debt, uh, debt, and also encourages on-time graduation. This dual credit program is vital to the state and vital to Hoosier students. Dual credit enrollment, this slide just kind of gives you a sense again of what we are doing and how effective we have been uh, with regard to our enrollment. We, get, we at USI over the past academic year have had 37 courses, a total of 190 different sections. We have offered this at 30 different high schools and also have had 105 high school instructors that have been approved over the 2019-2020 academic year. More importantly, nearly 2,400 students have completed one or more courses generating over 13,000 credit hours at USI. So I, I wanted to let you know that this is an, a very effective program, a very necessary program. Uh, another brag point that I wanted to bring forward is that USI is NASEP, uh, NASEP accredited. We are only one of six institutions in the state of Indiana and roughly one of 100 institutions nationwide with this distinctive uh, category. Also, with this, uh, with this request, we have two line item requests, the Nursing Expansion Initiative, and also our Strong Start program that I mentioned to you earlier. Let me begin by just kind of talking to you a little bit about the nursing um, expansion and, uh, and, and renovation project uh, that's uh, necessary for us to move forward. <clears throat> there is truly a short shortage of registered nurses. Uh, I've talked to Commissioner Lovers about this. I've talked to a couple of other commissioners as well during your visit to, <clears throat> excuse me, during your visit to USI. Uh, this is an area of great concern. The Evansville area alone already has hundreds of opening, openings at local health uh, care providers that are currently unfilled. Now, USI can be an answer not only to the southwest corner, but also to the state of Indiana. You know, we currently have students who are applying to our program with at least a 3.75 GPA who are not allowed to be admitted to our program. This current nursing expansion initiative will alleviate the accreditation limitations by expanding nursing faculty and also the simulation center staff to allow the university to accept more students. After three years of complete implementation, this initiative will allow the university to expand the Bachelor of Science and Nursing program by 120 students overall. This will allow also expansion of other nursing programs at the university. Again, I stress this because I really believe that based upon our reputation, uh, based upon our past rates um, over the last many years, but also just based upon the kinds of, of, of feedback that I receive in every healthcare professional setting that I'm receiving about our candidates, our students, our graduates, is, 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 is absolutely amazing. And so I would love to see us be able to, to, uh, to, to serve the, the Southwest Corner in a more effective way, but also be an answer to the entire state of Indiana. Our four-year one-time graduation rates of African-American males and African-American females substantially fall behind all students at the University of Southern Indiana. I mentioned this in my last presentation. This is our Strong Start program um, that, that we are trying to implement that will give our students an opportunity to better acclimate to the university. This data right here shows you that we've had an uptick with regard to our performance, but we are still woefully behind the, 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 the majority group students uh, who are attending the campus. And so I'm asking you, know, you for consideration uh, for this program. It will you know, provide you with an understanding that we are going to focus on the summer, uh, looking at ways in which we can recruit specific students to our program through our relationships with teachers and also administrators across the state. Um, we are looking at ways in which we can actually have these students come to, come to campus, uh, take classes, and have those classes go toward their, uh, their, their degree seeking opportunities. And then also have those students become more than just a revolving door or a statistic, but become a success story. Uh, while I was serving as provost at USI, I had gone out to my colleagues and talked to them about the group program at IU Bloomington, and um, they were extremely kind and supportive and responsive. In fact, they came to our campus and had a day meeting with us and began to talk to us about groups and how they had identified success routes, uh, best practices, uh, do's and don'ts uh, when, when developing this kind of program. 
And so having you know them in our, in our on our radar and our in the in the back of our head with regard to how to advance this, um, I really believe this is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to present to the, the commission again for your support. USI has also identified thirty thousand dollars that we want to contribute to this initiative, making sure that we have teeth in the game, if you will. The Strong Start Completion Program um, outlines right here just kind of a, an overview of the cost, uh, kind of giving you a sense of, of what this will mean. The one thing that I didn't do, I don't believe, effectively during my last presentation was help you understand this is not just cost for the summer, but this is cost for the entire academic year for each cohort. Uh, we will be engaged and involved with the student success um, on, on, a, on a daily basis. You know, I, I, again, my goal is to make sure that everyone in the commission understands that this is not a, a program that's going to open a door and close it, but, but keep that door open. Make sure that these students are successfully matriculating through the university. So I'm excited about this ask, and I'm asking you to please consider as well. Our capital budget project request, the right administration uh, building, the right building for renovation, excuse me, um, is also um, on the, on, on the uh, horizon for, uh, for improvement. This building is the actual oldest building on our campus. In determining the capital improvement budget request, the administration reviewed the university's 10-year capital uh, improvement plan, while also considering the, the current environment of public higher education and the fiscal health of Indiana. It is important that we consider the changes to course delivery model. We consider the, course, the response to COVID-19 and also whether more value can be brought through renovation projects rather than new construction of additional square footage at USI. And fortunately, our existing 10-year capital improvement plan aligns well with these considerations. The Wright Building has cycled through a variety of uses, uses over the 52-year lifespan of this building without major renovation ever. Many of the spaces within the building have been repurposed multiple times since its initial conception, and virtually all of its original departments have moved to different locations. The current structure holds classroom spaces that, necessi that necessi necessitate up updating for modern course delivery models and also offices that do not currently offer student facing services for students. You know, they are they're trying to navigate and meander through here and it, it would be wonderful for us to have this entire building um, uh, provide the kinds of services for our students that we believe in. And one one of our terms always at USI is student accessibility. The second part of the project is phase one renovation of the David L. Rice Library, which has remained heavily utilized by students on campus despite lacking the technology or a layout optimal for current use. Renovation of this space will include technology upgrades. It will also include changes to structural layout and more common spaces for study and also more co-working spaces for students who are working jointly and or remotely on group projects, online learning and also lab simulations. Finally, the university is requesting full funding in each of the each of the biennium of the general repair and rehabilitation and infrastructure formula to maximize existing facilities. Okay. In contrast to um, to our first slide that I showed you with Dr. Rice, this is my last slide, and I wanted you all to kind of go back to that first initial imagery. You know, a sketchboard with uh, with a dream, uh, a vision, and also the legacy of Dr. Rice. This right here is an aerial view of the University of Southern Indiana. It, it demonstrates again what's happened since 1965. We have produced over 44,000 living alumni. You all um, have transformed so many lives. You have done incredible work in working with us and partnering with us. I, I leave you all with one last thought. And that is a thought from Dr. Rice. You know, he talked over and over again as I study uh, his work about, about the power of people. He said, and I quote, the university's greatest asset are its students, its faculty, its staff, and its alumni. This commission believes in that statement. I believe in that statement. I am so thankful for your investment in us. I'm thankful for your patience uh, with this, this virtual presentation. And I now entertain your questions. Thank you so much. We are open for some questions or comments. Uh, this is uh, John Pop. I would like to back to that strong start completion program. I didn't quite fully understand it. It shows the fall of 2015 with 20% African males. Does that mean 
these are graduates or these are enrollments? I'm not sure from that chart. Yes, that chart that was a freshman um, in graduates. Uh, that was that was a cohort of, of students who were who were successful at USI and graduated in nineteen in four years later. Yes. What is what the cohort happened? size? We're, we're looking um, at admitting 32, approximately 32 students uh, within each cohort, uh, really kind of focusing directly on 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 admission and relationships with uh, with specific schools throughout Indiana. We've had some great success, you know, in developing some some good relationships with, with individuals, but but we still see kind of a revolving door, if you will, among students of African descent leaving USI, and so we want to be a bit more intentional, bringing them into campus a, a bit a bit sooner. Having them acclimate, um, take classes that will go toward their degree, and then also giving them an opportunity to, to, to really solidify a good footing on campus and uh, becoming full-fledged citizens much earlier. Great. So, do they get um, do they get kind of a grant? In other words, this uh, two hundred thirty-six thousand is to provide some funding for them, so they they got meals and housing and so forth. Is that what it does? Well, that those monies will actually focus on those kinds of summer costs. Um, we, we are, oh. We're trying to prevent interfering with their pay, their pay grants or if they're 21 century, we, we're not trying to interfere with that at all. But but if we can actually provide a summer program the way uh, we have observed and learned from other programs around the nation, but, but groups specifically at IU Bloomington, uh, that success with regard to that acclimation period and getting students, you know, some uh, footing has really paid dividends. This is a this is a summer get it, getting them early indoctrination and getting them comfortable. I, I get you. I see. Okay, yes. Thanks. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, and I'm, President, I have two questions on that. This is Al Hubbard. Uh, that's two hundred thirty-six thousand dollars for how many kids? How many students would that? One hundred and twenty-eight total students. I got you. So about two thousand bucks a kid. Uh, and then my other question is, I, I just noticed your uh your graph where you were uh, uh basically showing how y'all y'all did with performance funding I, and i uh, i'm sure the whole commission appreciated getting that information and uh, appreciate the great progress but unfortunately 2019 was a bad year is there an explanation for that with with your performance it looked like uh the graduation rates i don't if you go back to those uh statistics that you were providing at the beginning of your presentation where you were making great progress, but the last years it, it seemed uh, that uh, there you you performance declined. Did uh, I just read it? Uh, this is John. Uh, I think the graduations declined, but the enrollment must decline too, because he said their graduation rate is increasing, even though the enrollment declined. That I noticed that too. It it went from thirty seven point seven down to thirty six point zero. One of the things that we have done as a campus that I mentioned before in one of my first slides was we were, we've been very intentional and it's it's been trustee driven, it's been administrator driven, it's also been faculty driven that we improve the quality of our students. So so there truly is a dip with with regard to our enrollment um, without question. But but what you'll see though is an increase in the GPA and the quality of students. So we have been very intentional with regard to that effort. We, we also believe that you know focusing on college ready students as one of the commissioners had mentioned earlier was going to decrease the college debt was also going to decrease that revolving door but actually enhance the experience of those students and make sure that we have successful matriculation for those candidates coming in for well I must have misread it I I, I thought the performance actually I'm delighted that you're being very more careful about admissions but uh I, I, I must have mis, misread the, the slide. Um, I, I would just comments. comment, Al, I, I actually noticed the same thing um, uh, across a number of those categories. It appeared that the latest uh, uh, year reporting was a dip down. Um, so that was, I had, I had a similar question. But I did, I did want to say that I thought that uh, President Rashad, I thought you did a really nice job on your presentation. I think one of the things that was really interesting to me was we, we've had one presentation today basically asking for the performance fund, funding formula to be suspended. And then we have a presentation from you saying that that's uh, critical uh, to University of Southern Indiana. And I think one of the things that might be helpful to the commission, Teresa, would be us retouching base on the performance funding formula 
at why it seems to be working for so many universities um, and, and really understanding why it doesn't seem to be working for ISU. I think that'd be interesting to, uh, to take a look at. Thank you. I think one of the things that we can have this discussion, and this is not specifically to President Rashawn, but it's really uh, for all of our schools as we look at this going forward, and that is, you know, separating the costs related to COVID-19 and the feder and the funding sources that we can find to deal with that, uh, especially advocating together for more of the CARES dollars or what will be HEALS or HELP or whatever they call the acronym the next time around, uh, dollars coming to take care of the costs associated with COVID. Um, and, um, you know, we feel fairly certain that there will be additional funding for that. So I think we need to look at that very carefully and together look at how we can advocate for that funding. Very good. Any other questions or comments at this point? Thank you so much, President Roshan. That was an excellent presentation and very helpful to learn some more about your wonderful university. So Thank thanks you so for much. being with us. Thank you so much. May, may I just say hi to, to Pepper Mohar? I know she's a, a Nevisville person. She's also a USI alum. Uh, just want to say thank you and also welcome to, uh, to the commission. Okay, Pepper? Very nice. Very nice. Thank, thank you. Much. you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Well, we're ready to move to thank Ivy thank Tech. You. Favorite places Ivy Tech Community College and President Sue Elsperman. President Elsperman? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, commissioners, uh, for the opportunity to present today. I know you've had a busy day, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. I appreciate this opportunity and I about our mission. This is to meet the needs of Indiana for a skilled workforce, strong economy, and Hoosier prosperity. So many of you are familiar with this number, that 60% goal, back in 2015 when I was the vice chair of the Indiana Career Council, Indiana adopted the Lumina, if you will, for 60% of our workforce to have a high quality post-secondary credential by 2025. Last fall, SHEO and ESG invited Indiana to be one of seven states to participate in the Attainment Academy focusing on this goal. As the president of Ivy Tech, I was uh, honored to be part of that team and understand that if Indiana is going to reach that goal from the 48.5% where we are today, Ivy Tech has to be fully engaged. Our strategic plan is fully aligned and our initiatives must be focused on lifting Hoosiers to this goal aligned to employer needs. So in, at Ivy Tech, we've set our own big goal and that's the vision of our strategic plan, which we adopted in 2017. That is 50,000 high quality certification certificates and degrees, again, aligned to the needs of Indiana's workforce. So when I got here uh, four years ago, that was 21,000 certificates and degrees awarded by Ivy Tech in this past year in 1819, we reached 35,000, which included certifications. I'll talk more about that shortly. We think this year we will be pretty close to knocking on the door of 40,000 when we get our certifications added to the number. So we are very committed to this number. And if you think about this puzzle that we've created, uh, it is these are the initiatives in our strategic plan that focus on student success, recruitment and enrollment, career development, all about getting to that big goal. So I'm gonna just touch on a few of them. Many of you have heard about our eight week courses. We talked a lot about that the last couple of years. They are a tremendous success. 70% uh, of our courses this fall are offered in the eight week format. We see 6% higher, uh, completion, successful completion rates of those courses. We see 3% lower drop rates. We even now see that as we've been doing these eight week courses, our faculty term after term, we've improved the pass rates to more percentage points within our own eight week courses. So all is going well there. And we think we'll be about 80% eight week courses by this time next year, just being very deliberate with it. Um, you know that another strategy we've had and you've supported completely are short term certificates that align with employer needs. That has been our our biggest area of growth. Next level jobs being 
certainly the engine behind a lot of that growth and the workforce ready grants and we'll we'll touch upon those in a while um, achieve your degree is another area that uh, we have worked on and you've seen we have nearly 200 companies uh, with more than 4,000 students from those companies and having completed over 1300 credentials over the past four years. If you remember, this is a great partnership with the Indiana Chamber. It is tuition reimbursement 2.0 if you want to think about it that way. Um, I mentioned certifications earlier. We had 7,800 certifications last year, all and in our world, we only count those that are uh, earn above median wage and we work directly with those industry certifiers for that data. The only state or community college that I'm aware of that gets that data directly. So we will continue to do that in order to ensure that um, we're counting the things that really count for Hoosiers. Uh, two years ago, we took on our online. Uh, Ivy Tech has had online for many years. Our students need it. We don't, uh, we don't market it. We don't try to grow it, but our students who are mostly part-time working adults need online courses if they're going to be able to complete their credentials. So we noticed a big gap. This is not unusual with uh, other institutions, be they community colleges or universities having a significant gap in pass rates between online and face-to-face -face courses. We had a more than 10% gap. We have over the last 18 months reduced that gap to 4% by cohort by um, consolidating the courses by adding ed tech technologists who are helping our faculty become expert by certifying faculty in online and making sure that our best faculty in the online are teaching online, that we're preparing our students better, that um, we're investing in state of the art technology. So this also just happened to be very timely because when we went virtual this past spring, we had the technology and the expertise to do that. And then finally, I'll just say, as I look at that project, who's your recruit on the other end, we know that not every Hoosier who ought to be pursuing a post-secondary credential are here. That's our job at Ivy Tech. We have to find them. We have to build relationships with them, with their employers, with their community and faith-based organizations. From the Indiana Black Expo and Indiana Latina Institute to Gleaners Food Bank and the Center for Leadership Development, we need to be and work with where our students are that is part of our commitment to equity. So Project Who's Your Recruit is really standing up for the first time, what I'll call a real recruitment function, and at the same time using continuous improvement to upgrade our admissions through first term processes. So what I'll say is the puzzle is coming together. Let's look a little bit at Indiana's educational attainment gaps. If you, we have to address this gap with our 25 to 64 year olds, if we're going to get to that 60% uh, attainment, these are adult students who are likely low income, working, many are parents, and they represent a large portion of Indiana's citizens of color. Specifically on the right hand side, black Hoosiers have a 10% lower post-secondary attainment, our Hispanic Hoosiers have a full 20% lower attainment. If you look next at Ivy Tech, we serve Indiana's underrepresented minority and non-traditional students. 42% of underrepresented minority students attend Ivy Tech and notably more than half of our African American students in the state come to Ivy Tech. The majority- you know, Sorry to interrupt, but we are not, are you showing a slide? Are you we showing are. I, I am not. Uh, Mary Jane, yeah, I, I, I am seeing the slides. I'm seeing the slides. I don't, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing too. the slides as well. Okay, so it, sorry about that, Bev. Okay. That must be yours. No. Okay, so, uh, so let me just point you to then uh, looking at those 42% of underrepresented minority students attending Ivy Tech, and as I shared, more than half of our African American students. 
to the right, the majority of non-traditional students are enrolled at Ivy Tech. These are those part-time students living independently, many with children, and I will see virtually all of them having jobs. We know that Indiana cannot achieve its post-secondary attainment goals without serving these populations. Ivy Tech is uniquely positioned to address Indiana's equity gaps and post-secondary educational attainment needs. So next slide. So let's look at uh, our strategic plan. These, this is the plan that we adopted uh, two now going on three years ago. These are our eight goals and we made it really simple on you. We on the right hand uh, column just coded, are we meeting the metrics or not? You see lots of green and very proud of that green. And I'm gonna talk about the areas where we're not quite there. While we have uh, it, each year of our strategic plan, we raise our expectations on retention. We raise the expectation on recruitment and enrollment. So on retention, we have been raising retention, but we haven't met all of our goals there. Recruitment has been the toughest one, and I'll talk more about that uh, in the next slide. But before I go to that slide on recruitment, I wanna pop down to goal eight, which is equity, uh, diversity, equity, and belonging. We adopted this goal 18 months ago. Uh, it, it's gray on the metrics because we just adopted the metrics over this year. And as we come into the year we're in now, we will now be holding ourselves accountable to reduce those gaps. We have the baselines. Now we're working on reducing the gaps and have many efforts, in fact, in October, and we'll make it available to all of you. We will be putting out our first uh, complete equity report on the progress of the institution. So let's look at that goal to recruitment and enrollment. This slide says a lot. The middle, the, the blue bar, the average unemployment rate of Indiana, look at that over the last nearly 20 years. And then just above it, you can see how Ivy Tech's FTE almost perfectly aligns with it, with the exception that when a recession hits, there's about a six to 12 month gap before we start building up to the north. Um, now, conversely, look at the dark green line, the 11,382 uh, bar at the bottom. That is the average of our four-year institutions enrollment. Incredibly different in terms of our responsiveness to the economy and what a four-year institution traditionally sees. Um, when will we see that bump up? Um, it'll be interesting because we know that we have different dynamics with uh, the extra $600 in the unemployment check, with PPP, with uh, various forms of, of uh, stimulus coming out of the federal government. But um, this, is, this really does share a lot about our story and how as a community college we respond. Now, we're not happy with that. We think we should be always scaling up if we're going to reach that 60% goal uh, as a state in the next five years, we have to continue to bring Hoosiers back regardless of the state of the economy. But this, this trend line really says a lot about us. So let's move to the next slide. So as we speak to the, the times that we're in, we're appreciative of the CARES Act uh, we received 33 million to be split between our students and Ivy Tech. I'm proud that we were one of the first colleges to distribute aid to students based on their FAFSA unmet needs. We had checks covering half of that aid of that 16.5 million, more than 8 million, went out within a week of receiving grant approval from USDOE. But we knew that this did not represent all of the students who should be receiving aid. We knew many had not filed their FAFSA as we wanted to encourage them to do that so they would be eligible. To date, we have uh, distributed 11.5 million with the remainder going out at the end of this month. For the institution, uh, we have uh, invested, of course, in technology, computers, webcams, all the things that you need as an institution to be able to adjust. But we also did something very special uh, with 
uh, some of our funds to help our students, and that is investing $5 million in a subscription, a college-wide subscription to Cengage. So I'm going to have you go to the next slide and speak to that. So Cengage um, is our largest digital provider of textbooks for our students. Uh, it is, we estimate that on average, a student will save $180 a term. They have access to the entire library. 40% of our students will take at least one class with uh, that will use Cengage materials. Uh, this is so novel that we believe we are the only college in the country that has done this to do a college-wide subscription that makes the entire library available. And since we've announced this, uh, other colleges are calling us to explore it. So it's a very student-centered approach for our investment of the CARES Act dollars. Continuing to talk about how we've dealt with the pandemic, agility is the best word. I talked to you about how our online courses have helped us be able to adapt uh, in this time, investing in the ed tech resources, technology, faculty, and student training. Um, we also pulled forward uh, a model that came out of our Single Moms Initiative called Learn Anywhere. This is a, way, um, a modality, if you will, where a student decides every week whether they will go face-to-face, -face, virtual, or online. Um, we knew single moms, single parents needed that because what if your child gets sick? What if your hours get changed? And we were going to do that with a few courses, a few sections. Well, this fall, we stood up 400 sections across the state of Indiana with faculty volunteering to teach in that modality. Um, we expect to continue that. Uh, it's about 5% of our total courses. Uh, we've also pivoted to knowledge assessment uh, as AccuPlacer was no longer uh, an, a, a test that we could be using. So knowledge assessment is based on the EdReady uh, open source uh, subscription that we already have. The interesting thing with the knowledge assessment tool that we're using now is we are placing two thirds more students into college ready courses. We always knew that AccuPlacer was not a good tool for adults. In fact, we would see adults sit down with AccuPlacer and walk out before they finished the test because it was so intimidating to them. The knowledge assessment tool actually prepares them for the course at the same time. It's what we would have given as a preparation tool. So that uh, transition has gone well. Uh, and then, of course, we're continuing to pivot in how we use our uh, new career coaches, which I'll talk about shortly with our CCEC, but how we're using them to help us in this labor market time where we need career coaching, we need a labor market data demand, and we need to be able to share resources with the Hoosiers who are experiencing unemployment at this time. Next slide. One of the programs I'm very proud of was Ivy Tech's intent and commitment to help all Hoosiers who were unemployed and do that free because we not only want Hoosiers to get jobs, we want them to get better jobs. So we went out to our partners in industry and said, can you help us uh, offer some of this free training? So we, our goal was 10,000 free classes and trainings. Uh, to date, we've had over 7,500 Hoosiers register for at least one course, and I'll show you a the results here in a second. But we aligned all of it with high demand, high wage opportunities, those next level jobs, if you will, and adjusted the requirements. So uh, before we go, I want to say a special thanks to Paul Perkins. Paul Perkins, the CEO of Amatrol, partnered with SACA and ADIX on Industry 4.0 certifications that we could offer for free, unlimited, the SACA Silver certification trainings, which are now uh, workforce ready, grant eligible. So let me show who actually took these and in what areas. Of those enrollments, you can see they were in cybersecurity. You could see one of the big areas uh, with our uh, SACA I talked about, the Autodesk for CAD, the LinkedIn Learning, which has many, many uh, professional development in all areas of business, Cisco training, 
And then in terms of who took them, um, it was more than half were Hoosiers of color. We're very pleased that 37% uh, were uh, are black Hoosiers. Uh, and you see Hispanics, you see just, uh, and more than half were female, all in these high wage, high demand areas. We think we now have placed those Hoosiers in a better spot to get a better job. And some of them will continue that uh, at that training and uh, reach for a credential. The next slide speaks to something that we knew at Ivy Tech and our strategic plan was a weakness of Ivy Tech, but most community colleges, and that's in the career development arena. We spent two years researching, designing, gaining philanthropic partners, engaging with Ascend Indiana, and now we're implementing truly a world-class career development transformational experience called Career Coaching and Employer Connections, or the CCEC as we call it. The Lilly Endowment, as you can see, has been hugely supportive of this endeavor, and it's allowing us to bring the career coaches, the employer consultants, the career experience experts, all together to give, ensure every student gets career coaching from the moment they enter our door throughout their educational experience, and they're placed into high wage, high demand jobs and careers. While the CCEC has just launched in externally, it's been uh, launching for the past year and was a big part of our ability to be agile during this COVID time. I know many of you are interested in um, what programs continue in our program review. So I thought I'd spend some time explaining how we do it that those quadrants on the upper right hand corner you've heard about over past years, we put every one of our programs into one of those four quadrants. It's either quadrant one growing, mean there, meaning there's more demand by employers than we can fill with our students, or it's capped quadrant two like nursing where we fill every seat and we still need more and we, we're trying to expand but very difficult to expand to meet the demand. We have sh those areas that are quadrant three shrinking uh, where we have too many graduates for the jobs that are out there and those we are serious about shrinking and I'll talk through that. And finally, the goal of equilibrium. So where we have those uh, low employer demands, we are closing down those programs. Um, clearly, if employers aren't hiring and the labor data doesn't project growth, we don't need to offer the program. We're also realigning with our industry sectors to ensure the programs align with the skills needed now. For instance, IT is reconfiguring their nine current programs into five, which will integrate cloud computing, AI, and data analytics, among others. And finally, this is a real credit to what the Commission has done with Ivy Tech and the state. Our single accreditation is key so that now our campuses are making very wise choices on which ones should offer programs that really can't for, for the number of students and the need be offered on all campuses. You'll see several examples uh, there with Anderson and Muncie, Lawrenceburg and Madison. We're now very strategic to ensure all regions are covered so that students can still have access, but not every campus where the demand is too low to support it. And again, single accreditation is what allows this to happen so we can switch the, the, the program in Lawrenceburg is the same as Madison, is the same as Anderson, the same as Muncie, so lots of credit. And then finally, our Ivy Online is now allowing us to move some of those programs that may be relatively low volume, even regionally, uh, low enrollments and need even regionally to an online format where a student can still get that program, but offered only in the online uh, approach. And that's really the best of both worlds where they still get, excuse me, still get support from their home campus. Okay, kudos on this slide. Next level jobs, the workforce ready grant. You can see the strong numbers uh, that with the, the work the commission has done and the governor's workforce cabinet to elevate these high demand, high wage jobs. We have enrollments now of over 15,000 but what I really want to point your eyes to is to the green bar, uh, realizing that many of these enrollments are being covered, the tuition is being covered by either federal financial aid or the employer. 
and only you see about 2,500 this year uh, that used the Workforce Ready grant. We're so pleased that, that we know it's a last dollar grant, right? So if there's other means, that's what covers it, but it's still very significant in the role the Workforce Ready grant is playing. And then the bar to the right, you can see where those are being focused. So healthcare, advanced manufacturing, IT and business, all areas where there's extremely high need. To date, we have over 12,000 completions in these work, this next level jobs category uh, and many thanks to the Workforce Ready Grant. We remain committed to apprenticeships and so I thought you'd like to see where we are over the last three years. We continue to grow both the traditional building construction trade apprentices as well as the industrial apprentices. Those industrial apprentices are in places like Cummins and Rolls-Royce and uh, Fiat Chrysler or FCA. Those are some of Indiana's finest companies. But I'm very excited to talk about the future state of apprenticeships, which is our Apprenticeships 2.0. And we call it expand, rebrand, and reimagine. A good example of this is in the Industry 4.0 space where we're using this apprentice model and are one of the leading uh, in the nation offering the SACA certifications embedded into our advanced manufacturing certificates and degrees. And in fact, we're part of a national grant, which is Industrial Internet of Things Apprenticeship Expansion. So very excited about the work uh, in this space to bring the apprentice model to some of our other areas of high wage, high demand careers. So to one of our uh, areas of greatest impact, uh, dual credit and dual enrollment, I wanted to show you on one slide, uh, both dual credit in the lighter green and in the blue, the dual enrollment. Uh, dual enrollment is taught typically on our campus by our faculty and the students coming on campus and it has been one way that high schools and students have been able to continue to gain uh, college credit during high school when there are credentialing challenges with their teachers. I did want to note that 56% of our dual credit courses last year were CTE, 44% uh, were liberal arts, roughly a, that 60-40 split that has been pretty consistent over the years but we've been very intentional about completions. Nearly 64% of the, the credentials earned in high school have been in those CTE areas. Through COVID, we've continued to work with our K-12 partners for virtual instruction, faculty certifications, virtual work-based learning, the use of IV prep as a way to help our high school students, we call it level up, to help high school students with their SAT and dual credit prep for free. And finally, we've submitted our $10 million LEI phase three grant application focused on helping Indiana solve the teacher credentialing challenge with something we call IV Flex, which will use co-teaching and co-facilitation while also helping to fund more teachers to become fully credentialed by 2023 which, as you know, we have uh, a one year extension thanks to the commission's request. Continuing on, we have uh, the start as a sophomore or as you would say, the STGEC. You heard that, saw that mentioned, but I wanted you to see where those completions are. Um, the majority of completions in the blue and that far right shows more than 2700 CTs. Uh, being completed and then the next big stack of dark green being the STGECs. Uh, so wonderful on both sides. Just a note that that STGEC does allow a student to complete college in three years. Savings are tremendous, but also getting them into the workforce uh, a year early for earnings. Next slide. Our transfer mission is critically important. So transfer is a junior. Uh, is uh, or TSAP as you would call it. You can see the steady growth over the last five years, including the completions of those TSAPs. So what could be better than transfer as a junior? 
uh, would be transfer improved or guaranteed admissions. And I can't uh, compliment my four year partner institutions, public institutions more than as you see, guaranteed admissions is the next bar. So why guaranteed admissions? We still have students who think, oh, I just don't know if I'll get accepted, even though I'm doing the TSAP that transfers a junior, I'm not sure they'll take me at the four year institution. Well, our four year partners have really stepped up and we now have strong partnerships with virtually all of our four year partners. Uh, and I'll spell out two that have been ex uh, exceptional, both IUPUI, which covers IUPUC and IU Fort Wayne, as well as USI in Southern Indiana, both having more than 20 programs that will guarantee admission with the TSAP and usually a minimum GPA. They can add other requirements, but now a student is assured that if they stay and complete their associate degree, which we know research shows if you finish the associate degree, you're more likely to complete the bachelor's uh, when you get to that four year institution while saving considerable dollars. So very pleased with this and again, compliments to our four year partners to being willing. So let's talk performance funding just a moment. I wanna start by saying we believe in performance funding. We believe in it so much that we use it internally. It is the way I fund the 18 campuses. Every year we reallocate 10% of their funding uh, based on their enrollments and their completion and our performance funding criteria, which parallel uh, the commission. The, the concern I'll draw your eyes to is that green bar that is now almost 50% of your performance funding is on time rate. So keep that in mind, that's 50%. I'll ask you as you look to the next slide, what that means if you're a two-year institution. 91% of that on-time funding is going to bachelor's degrees, 9% to associate degrees. Why? Because the vast majority of our students are part-time. So they're not being, they're not being uh, rewarded for being that adult student returning, working at a part-time pace while raising families, while doing all the responsibilities of adults. So I would just ask that the commission consider how should we, if we're gonna meet that 60% goal, we have to have adults and those are part-time adults coming back to school. We should be rewarding those part-time adults and we should be rewarding the certificates that are being, that are in high demand by our employers. And again, to date, those are not being considered. So those are a couple thoughts that I'd ask you to think about. So now as we move into our budget request, we're gonna be pretty simple. We're asking that uh, we pursue dual credit funding back at the $50 per credit. We have continued to support fully and grow dual credit at the $40 level because we believe in it, but we believe $50 is the right amount for the work that the institution is putting in. And as you know, we're pursuing NASEP accreditation uh, over the next two years. In our line items, uh, we just have some renaming, keeping them at the same level, but renaming them, giving us a little bit of additional flexibility in them. And then finally, I'm pretty sure no one else has given back a million dollars, but I do want to let you know that um, that Fort Wayne Public Safety Center bonding is completed and that $1 million will no longer be needed uh, as a line item to Ivy Tech. So from here, we'll talk about then our capital prioritization. You all know that I've been on a path to reduce and repurpose our underutilized square footage, and we have done a substantial amount of reduction in square footage, uh, as well as uh, how we flex the space that we're in. Uh, most recently, Muncie's campus, we transferred their, tech, their technology center to the Muncie schools, a 60,000 square foot space uh, given away. Bloomington returned 16,000 square foot of the Waldron Art Center. We've sold or reduced, well, actually with our East Washington property, we sold it and we're leasing it while our automotive center is being built, but it will be a net of 
40,000 uh, more square feet gone. The Kokomo building from that campus is done, will be more square footage reduced. And with our new Columbus project, the edict was net zero, no new square footage. Uh, I will say that uh, in my time here, we've added 10,500 square foot in our in Elkhart. I just did the groundbreaking yesterday with the iFlex lab, but it's because their facility in Elkhart could not do that uh, that that equipment in the space that they had. That is a rare addition, and it will be rare because we continue to be committed to being the size that is needed to support our students, and that is not bigger that is smaller but right-sized. So what we have here are the uh, the criteria we use uh, as we think about our, which projects deserve to come before you, and then a committee which includes our trustees uh, as well as those who are experts in the college to rank these, a paired comparison, head-to-head -head -head comparison. If you could only do one or the other, which would you pick? So the two I'm gonna talk about are uh, Lake County and Fort Wayne. So let me go to our number one, which is Lake County. Uh, it, Lake County campus actually is three locations. Uh, it is Crown Point, which was a Purdue acquisition, and it has our health professions campus. Uh, you may recall IUN, where we're co-located in Gary with their Arts and Sciences building, and East Chicago is the Technology Center. It is very tired. It is 1981. You can see from the pictures there's significant uh, needs there. This facility serves a very diverse population and in need of major renovation. While it's well designed, it needs an updated facade, elevators, lighting, and restrooms. We already have a donor that's committed uh, some programming upgrades. Uh, and uh, you will see that this is zero change in square footage. It is just under 13 million. That is our number one. Our other request is a Fort Wayne campus. Now this is the third time that you've seen Fort Wayne come before you. It has been a bridesmaid, never a bride. Um, and we've continued to rethink it based on the feedback we've received most recently from the commission. Um, we inherited Harshman Hall, the state's children's developmental hospital in 2007. It has never been a good building for teaching or student services, and it's in terrible disrepair when we received it, including its mechanical systems. Our plan now is to demolish Harshman and Carroll Hall, which holds the boiler system, and replace it instead with a new student success center. It will result in a 150,000 square foot reduction and $280,000 per year annual savings. If approved, we will come back in two years uh, and complete the rest of the Fort Wayne uh, to bring that whole campus up to what our second largest campus in the state ought to be. But we knew we could not bring that large of a request before you in a year like this. So we've tried to be extremely uh, careful, thoughtful, knowing what the state's conditions will be in this budget year. Uh, last slide is just to summarize um, that Ivy Tech is Indiana's community college, uh, is aligned with Indiana's economy, driven by data metrics and accountability. I couldn't be more proud of the transformation that Ivy Tech has undertaken over this last four years, but we're not done. Rather, we're just becoming more and more agile, more student-centered, more employer-centered every day. And I would place our team top to bottom with the best in Indiana and the best in the nation. The year's been very challenging for all of us. Most importantly, though, it's been challenging for Hoosiers, for our friends and neighbors. And we're here to serve all Hoosiers with equity as a measure and outcomes that lead to Hoosier in Indiana's prosperity. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, for Yeah, we are, we are very much very in much admiration much. of uh, the flexibility of Ivy Tech over the last many years of change and continuing change. And uh, that was an impressive presentation.
Thank so you. we will open it up for some questions. Uh, Sue, this is Al Hubbard. How you doing? Good, Al. Uh, How are you? I am fine, thank you. Uh, I'm I, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, with the CARES Act money, uh, we have provided additional funding for workforce ready grants, and uh, I'd love for you to talk about what. Uh, Kind of impact that's had and how successful you've been at, at uh, recruiting and then uh, and also comment on whether you you and we are investing enough in marketing it to, to let the those who would be great prospects know about the fact that they can get these certificates without paying anything it's free so i'd, I'd love to just well, have you comment they, well, they, so the workforce ready grants have been, have been fabulous uh, they are meeting the need they are getting as i shared we have uh, more than 10,000 completed uh, we have 15,000 in the program today we would love to see more hoosiers and we would love to see every unemployed hoosier have the opportunity to uh, pursue one of those high demand credentials so that when they re-enter the workforce they're doing it at above median wages and transforming Indiana's economy at the same time, supporting those those most important jobs we have. We're ready. We're our eight week courses allow us to bring people on. So while our semester has begun in October, we'll have our next eight week eight week term, and we would love to have a way to market directly to each and every unemployed Hoosier so that they could begin uh, in one of those workforce ready grant next level jobs approved programs, which we know employers have high demand and need for. We have the capacity. Uh, we just have no way today to be able to know. We can't find the needle in the haystack of who those people are that are unemployed unless they reach out to us. So we would appreciate anything the state or the commission or others can do to help uh, bring those unemployed Hoosiers to be aware of the workforce ready grant and know that they can go with no cost uh, that those are completely free but we need the assistance to be able to connect directly to those unemployed hoosiers but we're okay. ready and can do so it. so this is teresa so what just so the commission members will know because i know you guys are doing extensive outreach i think about a hundred thousand leads have gone to ivy tech and vincennes for that have come through the website would you tell them how you communicate with people after you get that information? Yeah, so those 100,000 leads are anybody who clicked on anything. So first of all, many are duplicates and not what we'll call a, a very thorough lead. But yes, we outreach to every one of them. And then in addition, and we don't know, those are any adults. They may or may not be unemployed. Many of them are not unemployed, they're working. So what you know about most working adults is when they look, they're often thinking, oh, this is something that, oh, I just sign up, I don't have to do anything, and I'll get something. So we have, there's a lot of them that aren't understanding what it is. So we, when we explain that to them, they have to then consider, okay, can I start now, or do I need to wait until another point in time? What's different about those leads, and it's not quite 100, it's more, I, I've asked that question, it's closer to 50,000 that have come to us. Um, they're not, they're not ready necessarily right now. Uh, with the unemployed Hoosiers, these are people who are looking for what am I going to do next? And they have the time on their hands to be able to pursue this now. They need something now, which is very, the other ways have been just people who may see an ad. We do constant, uh, through StatWax, we do constant social media marketing. So we're always trying to fish out there, um, but you don't, we don't have a way to get directly to those who are most in need and most eligible at this very moment in time. And I think from the beginning of the recession when March hit and Indiana shut down, our hearts just go out to Hoosiers who are unemployed. And that is what we're here to serve. So any way we can create a direct pipeline between 
those who are unemployed and Ivy Tech, we should try to do that because that's what the, I say the state invests $250 million a year in Ivy Tech to be here. We're here. Now we have to make sure that those unemployed Hoosiers know, to Al, to your point, uh, where they can go to get that credential that will get them a better job for free because we want the state wants to support them in doing that. Um, Sue, so this is Ann Bowen. I, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. I just wanted to make a quick comment about how great I thought it was when you were talking about the Cengage program. That is an incredible opportunity coming, especially from the student perspective. I've used Cengage as a student and it really, I mean, their resources are wonderful. I hope that's a program that you're able to continue to have and that will also hopefully reach other institutions eventually. Well, thank you, Anne. And, and if we get flexibility on how we spend down the rest of the CARES Act, we will extend it another year. Uh, you're, you as a student, you understand and we're hearing it from our students. I think they think it's too good to believe that it could be, couldn't be true, right? But it, exactly. It, and um, we're just so thrilled. We know, I'll just add to Ann's comment, we know that in community college, a quarter of our students on average don't buy their books. How can you pass a course when you don't buy your materials, when you don't have what you need to be successful? So this is, a, this is an exciting opportunity. I will tell you that we have other publishers now coming to us too, saying, well, would you consider us? So I do think that um, I, I take no credit for having developed. Some of you uh, remember Dom Chase. Uh, that was one of his, and he's, he's on now. Dom, congratulations, and thank you for that tremendous idea to envision what we could do to support our students. I think you are on the cutting edge of a major change in higher education, because textbooks are the, many times the real uh, barrier. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Beverly. Our, we have a, a long-term goal to get to something we call inclusive tuition, and this is one step towards that, because how would you expect people to be successful, and, and why cover tuition and not cover the book when it takes both, right? It takes the materials, course materials, to be successful. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions or comments? Well, as always, thank you so much, President Elsperman, for a very thorough and helpful presentation. It's always good to hear about the good things that are happening at Ivy Tech, especially right now. Well, thank so you. It's our, it's our privilege. Thank you so much. We thank you, and we thank all the presidents for the presentations. Uh, we actually did it ahead of schedule slightly, which is kind of amazing. Um, so uh, it was a good day and we learned a lot. Um, we do have a small amount of business to conduct and we, I think, can do that and still end up ending earlier than we might have thought. And the first thing is some quick uh, reports from our committees. Uh, let's see who's first. Chris, it's you. Tell us about budget and productivity as if we haven't been talking about that. <laughs> I'll speak on behalf of the budget and productivity committee. Oh. Chris, okay. you're muted. Oh, I didn't know if he was on. If he was speaking. I think he wasn't. I think he was muted, but muted. go ahead. Alex. I was muted as I was handing it off to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take the hand. <laughs> so we only had one small project <clears throat> on the agenda, um, which was Purdue's deferred maintenance project, which was approved in the 1921 uh, biennial budget. Um, and this is an expedited item on the agenda. So that's all we to. Great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. That was good and brief. So Mike, it's your your job now to be good and brief. Maybe Liz can fill us in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Happy to. Uh, hopefully Mike's able to join us, but um, I'll just say that our last meeting uh, was really great. We heard from each of the public institutions on, we kind of had an overview of how they were handling the fall reopening uh, and, and just working through that, dealing with you know, student and, and academic and all the various challenges that they've experienced uh, trying to get ready for fall and, and just, um, you know, we it was really great to hear from them personally on that. I know several of you that don't normally participate in student success were able to attend that and hear those sessions. It was very good. That was that was great to have you there. Our next meeting will be 
our next meeting will be October uh, 22nd. So we're, we're looking okay. forward to that. So very, good. very good. Well, following precedent, I'm handing off. Ken, are you there? Yes, I am, Madam Chair. So I'd be happy Thank to give you, the report. Uh, the committee discussed uh, two degree programs, a BS in data science and an MS in occupational therapy. Those are both uh, in your agenda book uh, for expedited uh, action. There were a number of uh, discussion items. Uh, I'll only uh, pick out one. Uh, one, of, one of your 55 uh, action steps in reaching higher in a state of change requires that 100% of the post-secondary programs have an internship, work-based learning, research project, or other student engagement experience that has career relevance. So we provided the committee with an update on the work that's been going on in this area in partnership with the uh, steering group that uh, has representation from all the public institutions. I'm happy to report that uh, uh, as of Tuesday of this week, we have that survey out to all of the institutions. So there will be a uh, report back uh, to us and we would like to present that to the commission at its December meeting, uh, which uh, will provide the results of that survey of all associate and baccalaureate degrees uh, offered by public institutions and the extent to which uh, they have some type of uh, required uh, career relevant experience. Yeah, it, it is very impressive already just learning all the, every time you get into a topic like this, then you learn about the myriad of things that are going on all over the state and it's always impressive. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, academic degrees, as, as Ken just said, programs on the agenda for expedited action. They're listed in the agenda book in on page nine. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Move approval. Who said that? Chris Lamont moved oh, approval. Oh, thank you, Chris. Chris just, yeah. For the minutes, got, got a second there, thanks. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 No? I should ask for discussion, but I'm kind of assuming there isn't any. We have uh, one capital project on the agenda for expedited action. We just heard about that too. It's listed in the agenda book beginning on page 13. May I have a motion? So moved. Chris Murphy. Chris Murphy. Al Hubbard, second. Second, great. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay, several, as you always know, there are a number of uh, information items in the in our book, which is smaller this time. Take a look at some of those, especially some of the media coverage. Pretty interesting stuff. Is there any new business? Any old business? I should ask that first. Okay, our next meeting is scheduled for October the 8th, and we will hear from the other three institutions. And this, of course, will be uh, conducted virtually, so we'll see you all again. Uh, on the screen. Take care. We are adjourned. Will you oh, send Chris. us copies of those presentations? Yeah, Can Liz, I believe we are. That's correct. Okay. Good. I believe they were already sent to you. Probably just haven't opened them yet, but I think uh, Liz actually sent them yeah. just a little bit ago during your meeting. So if you don't Thank get them, you. let us know. Yes, Thanks. you should have you should have uh, links to them uh, electronically via email, and those are available on our website for viewing for everybody else. So very good. Great. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. You Bye, everyone. Bye Take care now. Stay healthy. Yes, stay healthy.